The Subcommittee on Energy will come to order. The Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. On December the 2nd, 1942, the world's first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction occurred uh, right beneath the surface in my district, in the first district of Illinois, <laughs> at the University of Chicago. This occurs in conjunction with the discovery of nuclear fission propelled our nation into the dawn of a new era. Since the creation of the Chicago Power One reactor, the world's first nuclear reactor, peaceful application of nuclear technology have provided uh, solutions to various modern challenges. This includes the detection and management of threats uh, to human health, food security, and demands for electricity. However, one of the greatest challenges face, facing our globe uh, remains with us, and that's the challenge of climate change. Catastrophic climate change is an existential threat that will spare no community from its widespread impact. The large-scale deployment of low carbon energy is necessary to decarbonize our economic sectors and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It is likely that the world's energy usage will see a 50% increase by 2050. We are faced with this reality, and uh, it, is our, it is critical that we employ every method of, at our disposal to effectively mitigate the consequences of this increased usage. This includes the use of next generation nuclear reactor design. At present, existing light water reactors account for up to 20% of our annual electricity uh, generation in our nation, making them the second leading source of low carbon emitting power and are necessary to meet climate goals and growing energy needs. To remedy challenges posed by climate change, nuclear plants must evolve, must evolve to become increasingly cost competitive, readily deployable, and most importantly, they must be safe and secure. Through the advancement of next generation nuclear technology, like small, modular, and other advanced reactor concepts, we, our nation, 
can accomplish these objectives. Emerging reaction designs are targeted to produce nuclear power with greater efficiency and flexibility. For instance, these dispatchable sources of energy may be assembled in factories and shipped to underserved, air, under, underserved, underserved areas. Apart from this, advanced reactor design may also result in the recycling of nuclear food, fuel, and much needed waste volume reduction. Today's discussion is deeply important to our nation's path to a clean energy future. And I want to thank each and every one of our witnesses for their participation. And with that, I want to yield to my friend, the gentleman from, oh, from Michigan, from Ohio, rather, my friend, Mr. Lana, uh, who's going to speak in, uh, in the time of the ranking member, Mr. Upton. Mr. Lana is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know my good friend who uh, is just to the north of me in Michigan, he's already got a big smile on his face when he said from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. On some times of the year, that's, those are fighting words in Ohio. So, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, yeah, yeah. thank you very much for holding today's yeah. hearing, and I also want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today on this very important subject. As we continue our discussions in this subcommittee about reducing emissions, there can be little doubt that nuclear technology will play a central role. Our expert panel of witnesses today will update us on the state of advanced technologies the prospects for these technologies in energy and industrial applications, what we should be doing to make progress towards actually licensing and building new nuclear power generators, and how we support widespread deployment both in the United States and in foreign markets. Advanced Nuclear will help the U.S. maintain its role as a global leader in energy innovation. The U.S. was the first to commercialize nuclear power for generation on the electric grid and for decades we led the way in the production of nuclear fuel. Unfortunately, we are now falling behind other nations, including our adversaries. If we're going to maintain our <coughs> energy security into the future, we need to invest in our existing nuclear fleet and streamline the deployment and advanced nuclear power. That is why in the last Congress, I introduced the Advanced Nuclear Technology Development Act, which required the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to collaborate on a regulatory framework and licensing requirements to provide certainty for the deployment of advanced nuclear technology. This legislation passed the House, and many of its provisions were included in a larger energy package that President Trump signed into law in 2018. I'm also interested in how we can maintain a durable domestic civilian nuclear industry. I commend the Trump administration for their attention to this issue, including how important it is for the United States to increase nuclear fuel production. In his budget, the President calls for the establishment of a national strategic uranium reserve to provide additional assurances of the availability of uranium in the United States in the event of market disruption. I believe it is important that Congress authorizes this action, and I plan on introducing legislation to do so. Aside from the energy security implications, having a strong domestic nuclear industry is essential to any conversation about reducing emissions. The fact is the nation's existing light water fleet is the dominant form of emissions-free power in many regions of the United States, far surpassing what is provided by wind and solar. <coughs> According to industry data, nuclear prov provides more than half of the emissions-free electricity in the United States. If we are serious about reducing emissions and paving the way for new advanced technologies, then we must maintain a robust existing fleet as well as the intellectual, technological, and regulatory infrastructure that supports it. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing with us today, and I look forward to this important discussion. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Yields back. The chair now recognizes and the chairman of the full committee, my friend, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Today's hearing continues the committee's series on building a 100% clean economy 
At the beginning of the year, I joined Chairman Tonko and Rush and other committee Democrats in releasing the Clean Future Act, a bold plan to achieve net zero greenhouse gas pollution in order to combat climate change. Mm -hmm. We have held 15 climate hearings over the last year, seven of them specifically designed to examine how to achieve deep decarbonization of various sectors of our economy. And today we will focus on nuclear energy's role in a clean energy future. Over the last decade, the power sector has made great strides in reducing its emissions. Nevertheless, it remains responsible for 28 percent of our nation's total carbon dioxide pollution. Fossil fuels also still represent nearly two-thirds of electricity generation, so it is essential that we consider any and all technologies that can reduce our dependence on fossil fuel and boost our decarbonization efforts. Achieving a fully decarbonized economy will require electrifying more things Americans use every day, like vehicles, furnaces, hot water heaters. We will also need to electrify most industrial and manufacturing processes. But electrification will only help us achieve our carbon production goals if the electricity comes from clean sources. Nuclear power is a stable and reliable generating technology that emits no greenhouse gas pollution. It should be an important tool for decarbonizing our economy. Yet an increasing number of nuclear power plants in recent years have ceased operations for a range of factors, primarily because of the challenge to compete financially in power markets. As these plants go offline, the generating sources replacing them should also be emissions free, but in many regions of the country this retiring electricity generation is largely replaced by natural gas. Advanced nuclear technologies have the potential to provide more of the clean energy we need to decarbonize our economy. Advanced reactors can be designed to provide enhanced safety features and produce less waste. They also offer more flexibility than the designs in operation today because they can come in different sizes and they can be constructed faster with lower construction costs and sited in more remote areas. While we have yet to see any advanced reactors fully commercialized, one project from New Scale is expected to receive final approval from the NRC this year. And there are also many other promising proposals in the research and development phase with an eye towards deployment in the next decade. Supporting advancements in nuclear energy and bringing these new technologies to scale is one piece of the puzzle necessary to meet our climate goals. We have to invest in renewable energy and energy storage technologies, which will play a big role in decarbonizing the power sector. But studies show that in order to get to 100 percent decarbonization affordably, we need reliable carbon-free resources like advanced nuclear power that can sustain output for long periods of time. Advanced nuclear also can work with other clean energy sources like solar and wind to fully decarbonize the power sector without big increases in utility bills. At the beginning of the century, there were rumblings of a nuclear energy renaissance with multiple large nuclear projects planned and the NRC staffing up to handle new license applications. But that didn't come to fruition, and we must contemplate how the next generation of reactors can be brought to market and deployed affordably. And this is something I believe most Democrats and Republicans agree on. I hope we can continue to work together to find ways to facilitate the deployment uh, of the development and deployment of advanced, safer, cleaner, and more flexible nuclear technologies. So we have a knowledgeable panel of witnesses today, including the CEOs of two companies actively working to commercialize advanced reactor designs. I hope we can shed more light on current challenges, the policies Congress can pursue to facilitate the transition, and how advanced nuclear technologies can play a role in achieving a full decarbonization of the power sector. I know I have a minute left, but I don't think anybody wants it, Mr. Chairman. So I yield back. Gentlemen, you back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for the purposes of his opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I want to welcome you and our, our witnesses certainly to uh, this really important hearing. Um, I want to uh, I want to thank you for having this. The the focus of today's hearing obviously is uh, fundamental to addressing climate change risks and one that Republicans have logically and proudly championed advanced nuclear technology. The most cost-effective way, indeed the only reasonable way, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and foster our national economic and security interests is through innovation, especially nuclear innovation. Encouraging the deployment of nuclear technology and, I must add, strengthening our current nuclear fleet 
and industrial base, implementing policies that helps reassert U.S. nuclear leadership globally. These all provide a really promising path forward to meet both our environmental needs and our energy security priorities. In fact, it's the only way forward to meet these priorities, I'd say. So today we can help, uh, so today can help us focus on what's possible and what's necessary to build on recent policies we've enacted to ensure we have the right regulatory landscape, the right policies to strengthen our domestic civil industry and the innovative technologies on the horizon. U.S. global leadership here is sorely needed. Exporting clean power and clean power technologies will do more to drive down global CO2 emissions than some arbitrary cap <coughs> that countries fail to meet. In May of last year, the International Energy Agency released an information report on the role of nuclear power in clean energy systems. It did not find current trends very encouraging. The report noted that nuclear and hydropower, quote, form the backbone of low-carbon electricity generation, close quote, responsible for three-quarters of the global low-carbon generation and the reduction of over 60 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions over the past 50 years. Yet IEA found in advanced economies nuclear power is in decline, with closing plants and little new investment quote, just when the world requires more low-carbon low electricity, close quote. There are various reasons for this, some relating to cost overruns and delays, others to policies that fail to value the low-carbon and energy security attributes of nuclear. In any case, the report found this failure to encourage nuclear will undermine global efforts to develop cleaner electricity systems. Germany demonstrates this very problem. As it chose to shut down its nuclear industry, it has doubled down on expanding renewables like solar and wind. Ironically, to make this work, it also doubled down on coal. This nuclear phase-out has cost Germany $12 billion, 70 percent of which is from increased mortality risk from stronger air pollutants. That's according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, by the way. If other less technologically and advanced nations even could match the rate of renewables, grow renewables growth reached by Germany, they would only hit about a fifth of what's necessary to reach climate goals and with more expensive energy. So, would they then be forced to bring online even more coal-fired sources than Germany? On the other hand, as outlined by the author, authors of the pro-nuclear book of Right Future, France and Sweden have both demonstrated in the 1970s and 80s how to do it. They showed that the build-out of nuclear can be done at five times the rate of Germany's experience with renewables, with increased electricity production and relatively lower prices. So I think the answer is obvious about the importance of nuclear energy. The question will be, can the United States take the lead going forward? We can help do that in this Congress if we fully acknowledge what U.S. leadership on nuclear will mean, both for cleaner power and industrial systems here and abroad, and for the ever-important national security attributes of a strong U.S. industry. Witnesses have noted in recent hearings that recognizing how the United States energy and climate policy affects energy and energy technology relationships worldwide is critical to addressing emissions where they're growing the fastest and for strengthening our national security relationships. Res uh, resurrecting technological uh, leadership and nuclear technology around the world will meet our broader national and energy security reasons, much as unleashing U.S. LNG from our shale revolution restored our ability to counter Russia in energy markets while also driving cleaner technology. Our nuclear energy exports boost our national security priorities. We on the Energy and Commerce Committee have been working in a bipartisan manner over the past few Congresses to enhance U.S. nuclear policies. There's most, uh, there, there is most certainly more to do, and I think today's hearing will help us explore some of that. Um, and that, that is both uh, administratively and legislatively to pave the way for advanced nuclear. Let me welcome the panel today, which I'm pleased to see represents several important perspectives, including industry, regulatory, safety, and international expertise. Two, uh, two innovative companies, TerraPower, and from my home state of Oregon, as the chairman referenced, NewScale. All of these witnesses can speak to what we need to, to do to build, operate, and lead with these new technologies. So let's work together on an even better nuclear power policy for America. Today represents a good first step, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written opening statements shall be made part of the record. I would like to now welcome, welcome our witnesses for today's hearing. Ms. Maria Korsnick is the President and 
chief executive officer of, nuclear, of the Nuclear Energy Institute, Mr. Armand Cohen, uh, serves as the executive director of the Clean Air Test Force. Mr. Joseph, he's there. He's there. He's there. He's there. Is, is the principal for the Energy Futures Initiative. The Honorable Jeffrey Merrin, Merrifield is the chairman of the Advanced Reaction Task Force, the U.S. Nuclear Industry Council. Mr. John Hopkins is the chairman and chief executive officer of the New Scale Power LLC. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Mr. Chris Le Levesque. Le Levesque. Sir, yes. mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Levesque. He serves as the president and chief executive officer of the Terra Power LLC. Thank each and every one of you, name by name, for joining us today. And we look forward to your testimony. Before we begin, a uh, little uh, instructions on uh, the lighting system that's in front of you. In front of you are, is a series of lights. Uh, the light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. And at the yellow light, please begin to wrap up your statement at that point. The light will turn red when your five minutes are up. And with that said, Ms. Kornick, you, Kornick, you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Welcome. Good morning. I am Maria Korsnick, President and CEO of the Nuclear Energy Institute, and I want to thank you, Chairman Rush. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning, and I thank the entire subcommittee for continuing to focus on nuclear energy and specifically the role of advanced nuclear technology in reaching our decarbonization goals. I sincerely appreciate the overwhelming bipartisan support that we saw for NECA as well as NEMA. <coughs> Both bills will help ensure that the United States remains a global leader of nuclear energy innovation. Nuclear energy generates most of our nation's clean energy. Nuclear generation helps to combat our climate crisis by producing over 800 billion kilowatt hours of emission-free energy every year. In 2018 alone, the current fleet avoided emissions of over 500 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. That's equivalent to avoiding all the emissions from all the cars in the United States. Looking at today's energy mix and at our goals for further decarbonization, it's clear that we need nuclear alongside other clean energy sources such as wind, solar, and hydropower. We need these technologies to complement each other, not work against each other. So we appreciate that the majority's Clean Future Act discussion draft takes a technology-neutral approach that values nuclear energy's carbon-free generation. States and utilities have also recognized the need to decarbonize the energy sector. California, New Mexico, Colorado, New York, and Washington are among the states that have set goals to require 100 percent clean and reliable energy by 2050, if not sooner, with more states likely to act. And likewise, dozens of utilities have also made significant emission reduction pledges with others already well positioned for a low carbon future by virtue of their existing nuclear generation. Electric utilities are looking for firm, dispatchable, carbon-free solutions to complement wind and solar to meet their decarbonization pledges, and they recognize that the second license renewal for the current nuclear fleet and advanced technologies are integral to meeting those goals. The U.S. leads the world 
in innovative companies, and the nuclear sector well reflects America's entrepreneurial spirit. NEI's members include approximately 20 advanced reactor developers with designs that range in size from a few megawatts to a few hundred megawatts to the large gigawatt class reactors. And advanced nuclear technologies could also contribute to decarbonization in other sectors, such as transportation. Electric cars should be powered by a carbon-free energy source. <coughs> and new nuclear technologies that can compete with other forms of firm carbon-free generation in the U.S. will be highly sought after in the global market. I'm extremely hopeful because real progress is being made. The Tennessee Valley Authority recently received the nation's first early site permit for a small modular reactor at its Clinch River site. And New Scale is expected to receive its design certification for its SMR later this year. Oaklow is expected to apply for a license from the NRC for their advanced fission plant. GE Hitachi and Kairos Power are actively engaging with the NRC on their innovative SMR designs. And Southern Company is teaming with TerraPower on a molten salt reactor technology. In addition, the nation's first AP-1000 light water reactor, Vogel 3, is scheduled to come online next year, and Vogel 4 will operate in 2022. These two reactors will generate enough carbon-free electricity to power a million homes and businesses. And we're also very pleased that Congress funded the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. This program sets a goal for two demonstrations to be operational in the next five to seven years and facilitates two to five other projects in the future. The show of government confidence in nuclear technology <coughs> is a catalyst for the capital investment needed for commercialization. Further, once passed, the bipartisan NELA will help ensure that our nation's advanced reactor program thrives in the coming decade, spurring innovation through demonstration projects, establishing a pilot program for long-term federal power purchase agreements, and providing a pragmatic approach to ensuring that the fuel to power these advanced reactors will be made available when needed. In closing, today's fleet is America's emission-free workhorse. Nuclear carbon-free energy powers our homes, our businesses, and our Navy. It enables deep space exploration, solves medical challenges, it helps fund schools and essential services in communities across the country, and nuclear generation provides a critical carbon-free energy <coughs> solution now and for the future. Thank you, and I look forward to working with, with you to ensure that our nation can take full advantage of the nuclear generation that we have to offer, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Coyne, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Walden and members of the committee. Um, I'm not going to talk from a written statement, but I want to really fundamentally address the issue, why bother um, with nuclear at all? We've got remarkable progress on renewables, thankfully. Uh, renewable costs have come down dramatically, 75, 80 percent over the last 20 years. Battery costs are dropping. Why would we want to uh, move forward with this technology. And um, I, we have a couple visuals, and I don't know if we can put up the first slide, if that's ready to go. And if not, I'll try and talk from it verbally. Um, the first slide that is in your deck, and I know this is kind of hard to see, and, uh, but on the left we see the amount of carbon-free energy we have to deploy over the next 30 years to get to a 100 percent carbon-free grid by mid-century. You can see it's a pretty steep climb. And in fact, um, it amounts on an average basis to about 35 average gigawatts per year. Now, to put that in context, that's one New York state's worth of electric infrastructure every year. So we have to build a New York power system every single year for the next 30 years, and it all has to be carbon free. Uh, so you get some sense of the scale of this task. Um, the bars on the right represent our best historic track record of building uh, capacity. On the far left, you have wind and solar, um, averaged over 10, 2010 to 2018, about three, gig, uh, three gigawatts per year. Um, the best year was five gigawatts, and on the right was nuclear during its best decade from the 1980 to 1990. And you can see that even that, uh, we'll talk about scaling advantages of nuclear, we still uh, would need to build at about five times the rate that we did historically. The takeaway message from this graph is that if you think you're going to get there with just one thing, 
one source, whether it's wind or solar or it's natural gas with carbon capture, if it's nuclear, I'd suggest that's a very, very risky bet. And so this, this game is all about scale and timing, and that's where nuclear uh, has extraordinary advantages. Again, very, very lucky to have the kind of renewable resource we have, but, but in terms of filling up that hole and hitting that one New York a year target, uh, we're going to need everything we've got. The next slide, if you can put it up, um, addresses, uh, and I realize it's a bit of an eye chart, but uh, it's in, your, it's in, your it's in the uh, printed copy of the testimony. So the other challenge here uh, is to make sure, as, as um, Ms. Korsnick said, that we have 24-7, 365 reliable power. Now what we've illustrated or modeled on the left is the western states at 100 percent wind, solar, and hydro. There's a little bit of a mistake in my testimony. This is wind, solar, and a very large amount of hydroelectric uh, power, which is to some extent dispatchable. But what you see is those shaded lines. The, the, we've got the full year represented on the x-axis, but we've got 68 days and then another 35 days when that wind, solar, and hydro output can't supply the energy on those days uh, by a significant fraction in some cases. Now, that's with nominally 100 percent renewable uh, ability, and, and this is a cost optimized, and we can go into the details. But those gaps have to be filled, and on the right you see what the storage requirement would be to fill those gaps. That storage requirement would be about 3.3 terawatts of storage. Just think of that number, 3.3. The entire U.S. electric grid is one terawatt. So we'd have to triple the size of the U.S. electric grid in just in storage, and just for the 14 western states. Uh, the, the capital cost of that investment would be about $1.6 trillion dollars which again, to put that in perspective, the entire electric bill of the Western states is 80 billion a year. So about a 20x capital spend over what the Western states um, spend. And so, so obviously the cost of doing this is, is very, very large. And by the way, uh, we dropped the cost of storage by 75 percent from where it is today to, to derive those numbers. So we're, I'm assuming a lot of innovation. The final slide makes the point about um, scale. And this, uh, what we see here is France, and it was referred to earlier. So this is the French grid from 1960 to 2015. The blue line is fossil generation on the French grid, and the red line is nuclear generation. And you can see that in a space of about 15 years, France went from entirely fossil to uh, about 20, 15 percent fossil. That was due to the nuclear power program. Now, that wasn't done for climate reasons. It was done to get off, you know, uh, Middle Eastern oil. But nonetheless, it shows you that when you want to scale this technology, you can do it very fast. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. It's a very power-dense technology. If you can scale and get to the rate, uh, we talk a little bit about how compact it is. But this is the kind of scale we need to be at. And I'm not suggesting that the entire U.S. electric grid be powered by nuclear, but you could do that. Or you could do a very significant fraction, and history proves that's the case. Finally, let me just make a, a comment from um, a, a quote I like from James Baldwin in a very different context. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed that is not faced. And what we have to face here is the size and scale of this problem and the fact that there's no perfect solution. Nuclear is not perfect, but it's good enough and it's there and we, and we can use it to decarbonize the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, now recognize Mr. Heiser for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, for having this hearing today. I'm Joseph Heiser. I'm a principal at the Energy Futures Initiative, or EFI, as I'll refer to it. Uh, EFI is an energy policy think tank that was formed by former Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz. Uh, I've had the good opportunity of uh, working with him now for over 10 years first at the MIT Energy Initiative, then serving as the Chief Financial Officer at the Department of Energy, and, and then co-founding EFI with him a um, little over two years ago. Um, our mission, simply stated, is to identify opportunities for innovation in energy technology, business models, and policy to accelerate the transition to a future clean energy economy. <clears throat> and so in the nearly three years since our founding, EFI has produced over 13 separate reports on energy innovation and clean energy policy. Many of these reports touch on nuclear energy issues, and I've tried to summarize some of those in my prepared statement. Uh, drawing from this statement, I would just like now to sort of emphasize five main points. 
first point I want to emphasize is in thinking about the title of today's hearing and really the theme that this committee has set, building a 100 percent clean energy economy, uh, it's important that we recognize that in doing so that we need to think about it in terms of net zero carbon. Um, even with significant energy innovation, including nuclear, not all sectors of the economy will necessarily become 100 percent clean. There are subsectors within transportation, industry, and the built environment where there may be no clean technological solution or where the solution will be cost prohibitive. Consequently, within EFI, we also emphasize the need for large-scale carbon management, uh, both carbon uh, uh, capture as well as carbon removal from the environment. Advanced nuclear technologies provide the potential for large-scale clean electricity, but a 100 percent clean energy economy will also require companion efforts uh, on large-scale carbon management. The second point I want to emphasize is that advanced nuclear energies are part of a key element of what we've called at EFI the Green Real Deal. Uh, as you all know, the House has a resolution on the Green New Deal, and that resolution has called attention to two very aspirational goals, one being the urgency of addressing the climate change issue, and secondly, the need to do so in a manner that ensures social equity. Our report on the Green Real Deal translates these aspirational goals into a framework for action that would create a clean energy economy in ways that minimize costs, maximize economic opportunities, and accelerate solutions and promote social equity. We've identified five foundational principles for the Green Real Deal, including uh, innovation to provide optionality and flexibility, building coalitions, ensuring social equity, and addressing all emitting sectors, <clears throat> and last but not least, providing an all of the above solution set. The reason I mention these five foundational principles is advanced nuclear energy technology reflects all of these principles, particularly in providing optionality and flexibility as part of an all of the above solution. And, w and looking forward from now through mid-century, we see optionality and flexibility becoming increasingly important as we look into the next decade uh, and, and head toward a, an ambitious goals for mid-century. The third point I want to make is that advanced nuclear energy technologies uh, are central to an energy portfolio with significant breakthrough potential. Uh, we have did a major study of the energy innovation landscape, and as part of that, we identified five particular technologies that we thought have breakthrough potential, one of which is advanced nuclear energy technologies. Um, and so we see that as becoming a very important point for many of the reasons that others on this panel will talk about. The fourth point I want to make is that simply that advanced nuclear energy um, and a, a strong federal role is important, not only for energy and climate reasons, but also for national security reasons. Uh, many people have touched upon it. But I want to just emphasize two points, one being the, the point about the fact that the U.S. has been a leader in uh, nuclear nonproliferation policy around the world, and having a strong and robust civilian industry is very important to advancing that goal. The other important goal is the fact that there is a very important interplay between the commercial nuclear industry and our nuclear navy, and those two are very mutually reinforcing. So in conclusion, I just want to say that at EFI, we do not endorse particular legislation. We don't, do not take formal positions, but we do very much support the uh, concept of improved uh, public-private partnerships. And we see in the legislation that you have before you many opportunities to do just that. So thank you very much. Thank you. And the Chair now recognizes Mr. Murfield for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, it's an honor to testify before you today. Um, I'm here in my role as chairman of the Advanced Nuclear Task Force of the U.S. Nuclear Industry Council. Uh, it has become very apparent that we must deploy a wide range of technologies to reverse the global production of greenhouse gases. I'm pleased to be here to discuss how advanced nuclear energy can help address this challenge. 
Over 20 NIC companies are developing advanced reactors using light water, high temperature gas, molten salt, and liquid metal, ranging from micro to large reactors. These designs have, have made tremendous progress over the last five years with modularity and safety features that allow them to replace coal or gas-fired units or be used for desalinization or process heat. Nick appreciates what this committee and its counterparts have done in passing a variety of nuclear bills as well as increasing funding for DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy. Last May, Nick attended the Clean Energy Ministerial in Vancouver. The head of the International Energy Agency, uh, Font Barol, talked about the role that nuclear plays in fighting climate change. Over the last 50 years, nuclear has reduced CO2 emissions by over 60 gigatons, equal to two years of global energy-related emissions. Yet, without policy changes, advanced economies could lose 25% of their nuclear capacity by 2025 and two-thirds by 2040. Absent life extension, these closures could add 4 billion tons of annual CO2 emissions, putting us further into the hole. As IEA states, it is considerably cheaper to extend the life of a reactor than build a new plant, and the cost of life extensions are competitive with wind and solar. As you know, Germany, which is seeking significant renewables, is shutting down 17 of its nuclear units. A December 2019 <coughs> study funded by the National Bureau of Economic Research states that German nuclear power was mostly replaced with power from coal plants which led to a release of an additional 36 million tons of CO2 per year. By their estimate, this increased particulate and SO2 emissions likely killed over 1,100 people per year in Germany from lung or heart disease. Several states, including Illinois, Ohio, and New Jersey, have adopted zero emissions credits to protect existing nuclear generation from economic shutdown. Unfortunately, a recent decision by FERC in December of 2019, which, which expanded the minimum price offer rule, or MOPR, will have the effect of eroding these efforts and re further reduce the carbon-free generation of these important plants. While wind and solar resources are needed to reduce carbon emissions, they are not the only solution. According to a recent MIT report, Firm low carbon resources, including nuclear power, bioenergy, and natural gas plants that capture CO2, consistently lower the co cost of decarbonizing electricity. Without these resources, costs rise rapidly as CO2 limits approach zero. According to the report, zero emissions cases without firm resources will require installed generation and storage that could be five to eight times the peak system demand. Nick believes that the demonstration program and federal power purchase agreement provisions included in the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act uh, that has been reported to this committee would significantly enable advanced reactors, and we support the prompt passage of this bill. I previously testified on the need for high assay, low enriched uh, uranium, otherwise known as HALU, for many advanced reactors. While many positive steps have been taken by DOE to address the supply of this material, Given the important civilian, military, and space applications of HALU, mm -hmm. we believe this committee will need to closely monitor DOE's efforts. <coughs> Over the last 30 years, the U.S. has gone from being the preeminent nuclear exporter to trailing Russia, France, Korea, and China in international nuclear deployments. Last October, I attended a NIC delegation to Kenya we met with the leaders over a dozen sub-Saharan countries who were investigating advanced reactors. They said the following, quote, we need nuclear generation to provide clean, carbon-free economic growth for our countries or else we will be forced to buy coal or other fossil plants because renewable energy will not be enough. We want American nuclear technologies and we want American nuclear systems, but we keep asking ourselves, where are the Americans? Advanced reactors provide a clear opportunity for the U.S. to retake the lead in the deployment of nuclear technologies and will spur exports, create jobs, strengthen our international relations, and provide clean, carbon-free energy around the world. Unfortunately, the ability to finance these technologies and export them <coughs> is hindered by the existing impediments in international finance institutions that discriminate against nuclear energy. We believe that the, the development of advanced reactors would justify the International Development Finance Corporation to reverse the prior OPEC policy prohibiting nuclear financing. Finally, 
Similar anti-nuclear policies at other institutions, including the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and others, are based on a lack of understanding regarding the clean energy benefits of nuclear. We urge Congress to seek the reversal of these anti-nuclear policies and enable U.S. advanced nuclear exports to bloom. With that, I thank you, and I request that the four reports that I reference in my testimony be included in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you have no objections, so ordered. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Hopkins for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be before you today. My name is John Hopkins. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of New Scale Power. The New Scale SMR is a disruptive technology that could change the way the world views nuclear energy and will play an important role in the next generation of zero carbon base load electricity. We are based in Corvallis, Oregon. We have 300 employees, and we're, our major private investor is Floor Corporation. Advanced small modular reactors offer an opportunity for true decarbonization with safe, flexible, efficient, and affordable technology. New Scale's SMRs have revolutionized nuclear safety with a very simplified design and walk away safe technology. Each New Scale module can generate up to 60 megawatts of electric power. Up to 12 modules are housed at each site, providing a total of up to 720 megawatts. All 12 modules can shut down and self-cool for an unlimited period of time with no operator interaction, no need for additional water, and no electricity requirements. SMRs can integrate with renewable energy and can load follow, provide reliable power to mission critical facilities and to industrial processes like desalinization and serve as a mission free base load power. Recent studies by MIT, the International Energy Agency, in the E3 study commissioned by Energy Northwest of the state of Washington show that without nuclear energy, cost of achieving deep decarbonization goals will be two to three times higher. The new scale design has been under review by the NRC since 2017. The 12,000 page design certification application took over 2 million engineering hours, involved over 800 people, and cost $500 million to prepare. In December 2019, the NRC completed phase four of the review. Completion of phase four signifies near completion of the technical review for the design certification application. The NRC is on track from completing New Scales DCA by the end of this year, 2020. To reduce risk for the first of a kind technology, DOE has supported public private partnerships and the program is working. In 2013, New Scale won a very competitive DOE 50 50 cost share funding opportunity, which accelerated New Scale's advancement through a very complex NRC, NRC design certification process. This is what DOE's SMR program is created to do, and our success is due to your strong bipartisan support. New Scale is the only near-term commercially deployable advanced technology today. We are preparing for our first deployment project, the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems Carbon-Free Power Project, which will be sited at the DOE's Idaho National Laboratory. New Scale's innovative manufacturing process and investments in SMR technology are helping to grow the clean energy economy. Our supply chain is already extensive with over 50 suppliers located in 25 of our states. We anticipate over 1,000 construction jobs per plant, and once operated, each new scale plant is expected to employ over 300 full-time employees with an average salary of $85,000. This is about twice the workforce of a similarly sized coal plant and six times that of a combined cycle natural gas plant. There are several policy measures Congress can take to speed growth in our advanced nuclear community. Continued resources for Department of Energy's public-private partnership should be a priority. If appropriations for DOE's SMR program continue, funds will be used for acceleration of design finalization activities development of the manufacturing supply chain in this country, and site licensing and deployment activities. NRC should have sufficient resources to process advanced nuclear applications in a timely manner. The Nuclear Energy Leadership Act introduced by Representatives 
Luria and co-sponsored by 25 bipartisan members will accelerate growth in the advanced nuclear community. The Clean Future Act includes important changes to federal long-term power purchase agreements. The, provis the provision would help reduce the risk of advanced reactor projects by extending the maximum length of federal power purchase agreements to 40 years. We are grateful for the support of the Department of Energy in the Congress. We take the responsibilities associated with the use of our taxpayer dollars very seriously and are singularly forced on our role in the reestablishment, as many have said in this table today, of U.S. leadership in our nuclear technologies. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify for you today, and I'm looking forward to your questions. I want to thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. LeVay for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush and members of the subcommittee. My name is Chris Levesque, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of TerraPower, an advanced nuclear technology company based in Bellevue, Washington. Including the past five years at TerraPower, I've spent my entire career working in nuclear energy, beginning with my service in the Navy on submarines. I've also had the opportunity to work on civilian nuclear projects in the U.S. and internationally. These experiences greatly inform my comments today as well as my belief that the U.S. must retain its leadership in nuclear energy technology. In 2006, our company's founders, Bill Gates and Nathan Mervold, began looking for a technological solution to the dual challenges of the growing global demand for energy and the rising threat of climate change. The answer, they discovered, is advanced nuclear technology. The United States, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, provides a number of pathways to keep global emissions below 1.5 degrees Celsius. None of those pathways will be achieved if we allow for a reduction in the share of global power provided by nuclear. In fact, the high economic growth scenario calls for global nuclear power demand to increase by five times current levels. Because nuclear provides always available power, it can play a key role in a 100 percent emissions-free future. TerraPower's designs are walk-away safe and use natural forces like gravity and air cooling, not human intervention, to keep the reactor safe when faced with unplanned events. Our plants can run on natural or depleted uranium and can reduce waste over conventional designs by nearly 80 percent. Because they do not require enrichment and because they burn up more of the fuel in the reactor core, <coughs> they significantly reduce the risk of proliferation. These improvements make our reactors safer, cheaper, and able to operate with lower volumes of waste. Our technology is also specifically designed to integrate into a grid with large amounts of wind and solar generation. We are developing an integrated energy system that uses heat from our reactors to store energy in a molten salt loop like a giant thermal battery. This stored energy can be used during periods of low solar and wind activity and can also be used to supply industrial processes that currently <coughs> require the burning of fossil fuels. Our reactors will be essential for reducing hydrocarbon use in the industrial and transportation sectors as we move towards a carbon-free economy. As we measure a, a measure of the urgency and interest of our work, I'd like to mention the remarkable nature of our workforce. We have attracted mission-driven, talented, sought-after young minds who want to solve the climate crisis. We compete with our neighbors in Seattle at Microsoft, Amazon, and others across the nation for the best and brightest minds in engineering and science. They push us every day to solve the remaining challenges in our path to demonstration and deployment. It's important that Congress supports the demonstration of advanced nuclear technology. Because our designs are novel and cutting edge, it will be virtually impossible to find sufficient capital to build a commercial reactor without first demonstrating these new reactors at scale. We are excited that the fiscal year 2020 appropriations bill provides $230 million for demonstration of advanced nuclear reactors. It also provides for continued investment in the versatile test reactor, the VTR, a key platform for nuclear innovation. We also support the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, NELA, and appreciate the number of members of this committee who have joined as co-sponsors of NELA. NELA builds on the work of this committee to encourage innovation and private investment. And finally, we are grateful for the interest and leadership demonstrated by this committee on climate change. 
Our company was founded on the premise that we must end global energy poverty while at the same time protecting the planet. We wholeheartedly believe that America is up to solving the challenge of climate change, and TerraPower is ready to play a key role in making a 100 percent emissions-free future a reality. In conclusion, we know America can lead in nuclear innovation. In the coming decades, many new countries will employ nuclear energy to meet their growth needs. China and Russia stand poised to supply these countries with their technology. The U.S. needs to be ready with our own. On behalf of TerraPower's 150 innovative employees <coughs> working to make that goal a reality, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee. The Chair thanks all the witnesses. We have concluded our opening statement phase of this hearing, and now we will move to member questions. Uh, each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. <coughs> and I will start uh, by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, as mentioned, global demands for electricity are likely to double by 2050. With this in mind, Mr. Coyne, would you detail the importance of pairing firm and dispatchable energy sources, specifically nuclear power, with renewable? Right. Well, Mr. Chairman, first of all, just to recognize the size of that, um, while the U.S. electric demand may double, it may triple or quadruple in developing countries, which you look at a country right now like Bangladesh, uh, where virtually there's no electricity per capita. So we're looking at much bigger multiples of growth in some of those countries. And the question really becomes, and some people would say, well, let's just build all solar and wind, and we'll do batteries. And again, the analysis I showed you is you can do a lot of that, and you know, I think the modeling would say you can probably do it pretty cheaply until you get to the 50 percent of energy mark. But to get to those very high levels, you do need this firm capacity. And as was mentioned, several of the technologies being developed uh, not only provide firm capacity, but can also go up and down with the wind and sun. So those mm. poles I showed you would be complemented rather easily by nuclear. So for the developing world as well as for the U.S., it's clear that, that we're going to need a lot of kilowatt hours and we're going to need a lot over the next 30 years, and that nuclear is, is clearly a potential uh, player in providing that, those kilowatt hours. Uh, Ms. Courtney, uh, what challenges does nuclear power face with current electricity markets, and how will they impact the next generation of technology? In the current marketplace today, the attribute that nuclear brings uh, to the table is its carbon-free nature, and that's not recognized by the market. Um, in one case, we imagine that it's a fair market, but there's a lot of things that are actually at play in this market. So you have some things that get a subsidy. Um, we also have the very low cost of natural gas due to success of fracking. And nuclear is really getting squeezed, uh, if you will, from, from both sides. And so the real uh, case here is <coughs> you need to value the nuclear, the carbon-free attribute that nuclear brings to the table in order to make that business case for those plants of the future <coughs> in some of the markets. Um, Mr. Heath, he's there, uh, recent plant closures uh, have sparked concern over the future of emerging reactor design. According to a March 2019 EFI report, approximately 72,000 people are employed by the U.S. commercial nuclear power sector. What impact, if any, will nuclear, nuclear power plant closures have on the next generation technology and the nuclear workforce uh, in general? Thank you for that question. Uh, the, we conduct an annual uh, energy employment survey that supplements the work that's done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that captures a lot more of the data on the energy workforce and, as you indicated, 
Uh, our last survey showed that there was a total of over 72,000 workers in the nuclear sector, including nuclear fuels. And that number, by the way, is about one-third higher than what you would see in the Bureau of Labor Statistics data because we capture a lot of the contractor data that don't show up in some of the BLS classifications. A as others have indicated here at the table, uh, nuclear plant employment tends to be much higher than at other uh, generating facilities, whether it is um, uh, natural gas combined cycle or even coal. And so a closure of a nuclear power plant uh, can have a very significant impact, not only on direct employment, but also on the kind of the ripple effect as well, because many of these plants are located in areas where they are by far the largest employer or in many cases the sole employer. So that's a, a very significant um, uh, issue that has to be taken into account. The flip side of it is it's a great opportunity for advanced nuclear to provide jobs, particularly in cases where plants have been shut down, like coal plants or other plants, for other reasons. One second, the chair's time is up. Uh, now the chair recognizes my friend uh, from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for five, Ms. Mr. Lano, for five minutes. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And again, thanks to our witnesses for appearing today. I greatly appreciate your testimony. Uh, Commissioner uh, Merrifield, if I may start uh, my questions with you. In your testimony, you point out that the United States has fallen out of a leadership position when it comes to nuclear exports. Would you expand on the economic and national security implications of having a strong U.S.-based nuclear energy en industry out there? We know that if you sell a nuclear power plant to a country outside of the United States, that creates uh, the foundations of a relationship that can date 50, 60, even 100 years down the road. If you look at the beginning of training the, the workforce there, building the reactors, supplying the fuel, and having the engagement of, of U.S. nuclear technology providers uh, actively engage with that country. As we lose those opportunities to other countries around the world, and, and Russia and China are the two countries right now who are being uh, most aggressive in their building platforms and are providing uh, significant financial support for deploying their reactors, uh, that, that really puts us behind the eight ball. So uh, these, are, these are critically important that we, we establish those relationships and provide those exports. It's a matter of jobs. It's a matter of national security. And to the extent that we have Americans involved with programs outside of the United States, it gives us an insight on those programs. That has a commensurate benefit with nonproliferation goals. Let me follow up. Uh, what can Congress and the Department of Energy do to encourage American investment in uranium mining, conversion, and enrichment to make sure that we regain our leadership role in nuclear energy? Well, we have uh, extraordinary uh, capabilities in the United States to provide for uranium mining, and, and certainly the activities are they're being undertaken to, to consider having a, a, uh, um, a supply of that available is, is worthy of consideration of this committee. Um, it is critically important that we have the other steps in the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, right now we have one conversion facility, uh, the Honeywell Metropolis site that is currently shut down in, in, uh, for temporary shutdown uh, because of a lack of need for those services. Um, we as a country do not have any uh, U.S. owned enrichment facilities. We do have Urenco, which has a facility in New Mexico. Um, that is supplying a, a portion of the U.S. fleet. But for, for uses of the U.S. military, for uses of, of higher enrichment of, of fuel, uh, for some of our, our, our needs in space and needs uh, for the military, that can't be supplied by the Urenco facilities. Uh, we as a country need to have the ability to, to do higher enrichment, enrichments of fuel that we don't have. So that, that is a critical an area of critical importance, and one I think the Department of Energy should be credited for actions that they are taking uh, in terms of trying to, to, to address that need. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Levesque, uh, as the leaders of two American companies operating in the nuclear sector, I'd like to get your perspectives on a couple of issues. What type of assistance are your foreign competitors receiving from their governments to develop and deploy advanced nuclear technologies? I'd like to start, John Hopkins. What, what we're seeing, and it was just mentioned in China and in Russia, they're actually in the process of developing their own, what they call small modular advanced reactors. 
I believe what they offer typically when they go into areas of sub-Saharan Africa or the Arabian Peninsula, they do a wraparound financing package. So not only do they bring the deployment of a technology, they're also willing, because they're state-owned enterprises, so it's more of a government-to-government -government sale with financing as part of the process. Ms. Lavoie? And I would agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Hopkins, and I would add, uh, as long as we allow that to go on without encouraging uh, U.S. nuclear energy companies to, to move forward internationally, um, you know, the Chinese and Russian counterparts are just increasing their experience um, as they, they build more of these plants. Because as what we've seen with some of our own challenges in building new plants, par part of that is due to inexperience. So um, as the Chinese and Russians move forward with these uh, plants uh, domestically the, and internationally. On the inexperience, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, well, I'll, you know, I'll compare it to my U.S. Navy experience where, um, you know, at Newport News Shipbuilding, you were able to see uh, the benefits of serial production in, in different uh, submarine classes. The, the first one, understandably, would, would cost more, but soon uh, the shipyard uh, workers and engineers would, um, you know, learn plant to plant, and you'd see a, a sharp learning curve and, uh, you know, strong um, uh, reduction in, in costs as you move from the first to second to third plant. And, and what we've seen in the U.S. in the last 20 or 30 years is that uh, we haven't really committed to a new build program that's allowed us to have that kind of uh, learning curve and, and to you know, realize that reduction in costs that, that you get. So we, we really need to get um, our, our experience level up, and we need to do that by starting to build plants again. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, and I yield back. Gentlemen, you yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you holding this hearing today, and we're looking forward to it. Um, nuclear energy represents currently 55% of our emissions-free energy in America, and I think I understand the strong case you've all made that uh, emission-free advanced nuclear technology has to be part of our plan to solve the climate crisis. I want to note that in my district, we have a number of smart physicists and engineers performing groundbreaking work in advanced nuclear. Uh, they're creating new materials like silicon carbide uh, ceramics that can be used in new or existing reactor fleets, and they work at a constituent company called General Atomics, where gen hundreds of people are working on advanced nuclear reactors that produce less nuclear waste and provide energy that is cheaper and safer. The company is also participating in the nuclear fission program known as ITER, which, um, which partners with over 30 other nations, to, I'm sorry, to, to develop fusion tech energy technology, and that's the kind of science that I think Congress and the DOE would like to support. Um, I don't want to skip a step, though, because um, there's a, obviously a political challenge uh, associated with this, and I think I, I haven't really heard you address the waste issue. Uh, one of the major candidates for president who claims he's uh, for addressing the climate crisis has ruled out nuclear, and I think there's a sense that, and I, sh I certainly have this in our district where we've um, we've seen the closure of the the, the plant at San Onofre, or north of my district. Uh, people are concerned, why would we go down this road if it's going to generate more waste? I know that that's not the case here. I'd like to see maybe, Mr. Hopkins, you talked a little bit about small um, small reactors. Why? Sh what should I tell my constituents about why they shouldn't be worried about waste? Having come into this industry, sir, seven years ago, I was quite amazed at the rigor that we put under dry cast storage in of what we call our spent fuel, what I call actually unused energy, in that our particular reactor, the core is one twentieth the size of a gigawatt size reactor, and our plan is to from That's a new and old. I'm sorry. The, the new technology. And yes, the sir. The, yeah. Okay, from ahead. the legacy of tech, one twentieth the size. Our object, our intent right now in our facility is to have 60 years of storage at site for the amount of uh, spent fuel that we'll use during that cycle. Is there less residue at the end of the process under the new technology? Less residue? Less waste, uh, effectively? For, well, with the, one, with the core of less than one, our megawatt reactor at 60 megawatts would have less amount of total volume. Um, let me say, too, that uh, I was listening to Mr. Cohen and, and the quantity of, of this task. Um, it strikes me that uh, the government is, is by nature, bureaucratic, slow to 
uh, respond to the need for innovation? Do you see any things, maybe I'd, I'd offer this uh, question to other people, any things we should be doing in terms of permitting to make these goals more achievable? Uh, I was actually a co-founder of something called the Nuclear Innovation Alliance that put forward, um, particularly to the NRC, um, a series of suggested approaches to make the NRC licensing process more innovation friendly, which thankfully the NRC has taken up. Okay. Um, you know, rather than trying to license by exception from a traditional playbook of, an, of a traditional light water reactor, I think the NRC has got the message that they need to prepare kind of a separate lane for innovation. So that's in terms of, of safety licensing. In terms of permitting on the ground, um, you know, I think, I think that the, the issue is going to be public sentiment. And frankly, um, I talk to a lot of my colleagues in the environmental community who might have a concern about waste or they might have a concern about safety. Um, but they also recognize the size of the lift. And I, my guess is you're going to see significantly more support for this technology over time, and particularly as the climate issue becomes more urgent. Con Congress, is, uh, having sure. served as NRC commissioner, I, I, you know, five years ago I, I would have had a much uh, bigger list of concerns about the direction the NRC is going. I think they should be commended. I think based on the recommendations that many of us have made, um, they have made a lot of progress in creating a more risk-informed framework for advanced reactors. They've got a lot of work in play. Clearly more work needs to be done to avoid, you know, half, half billion dollar investments to get licensing, but I think progress has been made. One, one thing I wanted, I, I didn't want to leave on the table, you asked, a, I think, an important question that people ask about waste. Um, having been a regulator of that and having been on spent fuel transports, <laughs> um, I think the thing that, that folks need to remember, nuclear, used nuclear fuel is the most heavily regulated and safest protected metal in the world. If you took all of the used nuclear fuel in the United States, all of it, it could fit in the San Diego Stadium where the Chargers used to play up to a, about a depth of 20 feet. No one anywhere in the world has ever been injured by nuclear used fuel. No one anywhere ever. We've got tankers full of chemicals that are on our highways that could cause prompt deaths very quickly. We, that, that is, is me, that's a much greater concern than the transport of, of nuclear waste. My time has expired. I just let the record reflect that no one suggested that that would be a use for our old stadium. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Duncan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I'm from South Carolina, and we lead the country in nuclear. Seven reactors generate nearly 53 percent of the state's electricity and over 95 percent of the state's carbon-free emissions. While we produce nuclear energy, we also produce nuclear waste. Commercial reactor sites store in my state around 4,800 metric tons of used fuel as of 2017. In addition, Savannah River site stores approximately 8,000 tons of vitrified nuclear waste from the EM and 35 million, million gallons of high-level liquid waste from their environmental management uh, cleanup. So South Carolinians have contributed, due to the um, Waste Policy Act, $3.1 billion, including interest, to the DOE's Nuclear Waste Fund to permanently dispose of the used nuclear fuel at Yucca Mountain. This is the third most of any state in the country. As small as South Carolina is, we've paid um, almost more than any other state. We're number three in the country. We want something for our money, and that is to store the nuclear waste. Nuclear waste currently sits 122 sites, 38 states around the country. In addition, we have 12 tons of plutonium at Savannah River site, and the mixed oxide plant is now in mothballs. So the lack of durable used fuel programs given the U.S. nuclear industry a black eye. Seventy percent of all reactors currently under construction are from Russia and China. These two countries, who are also our adversaries in certain ways, are positioning themselves to take a leading role in establishing global nuclear norms. I think several of the panelists have talked about Russia's positioning this morning. If we want to maintain our competitiveness in the global nuclear arena and continue to incentivize investment in the industry, it's imperative that we as a nation establish an integrated waste system and permanent repository. I had the opportunity to talk with the President on Friday evening about this particular issue. And he pointed out that Russia has stored a lot of their nuclear waste, I say stored, dumped into the ocean. That's alarming. So I think everyone's supportive for pursuing advanced re reactor technologies, but we also need to prioritize maintaining our existing fleet. 
I'm fascinated with SMRs. I'm fascinated with thorium reactors. Uh, the whole molten salt aspect that uh, Mr. Levisk talked about. Um, Mr. Merrifield, given the lack of an integrated fuel system, new commercial reactors will be de facto waste sites as they currently are. How does the lack of an integrated waste system with interim storage linked to a permanent repository inhibit the progress of the U.S. nuclear industry? Well, it's certainly from the, from the questions that we received from the public, it is an issue with, uh, on their concern. I think, um, you know, I, I have a tendency to try to look at the, at the bright side of things. I think we are making progress. We have the used fuel at the sites, which is stored very, very safely in, in uh, storage facilities, both wet and dry. We have the opportunity before us to have two uh, interim storage facilities, one in New Mexico and one in Texas, that could provide an interim opportunity to store that fuel until Congress makes a decision with the President on moving forward with a final repository. One of the things that's going to happen in the context of the next year is that the world's first uh, used fuel long-term uh, repository will be opening in Finland. If you were to travel to that site, and I, I suggest folks do that, you would see it is a very straightforward way of storing that fuel. We have the technological capability as a country to store used fuel safely. Um, I personally looked at the Yucca Mountain issues. I think I personally think it's a perfectly fine place to put it. Um, we need to make a political decision uh, in terms of moving forward, and that obviously rests with, with all of you. Well, the decision was made in the 1980s. The geological site was found in Yucca Mountain. I've been out there a well, as well as a nuclear uh, national solution to a national problem. You know, I'm from South Carolina. We had a, a nuclear reactor uh, being constructed. Um, Southern Company and uh, SCANA both are the only new reactors built in over 30 years, so I think this one in, in Tennessee. So um, I can't really talk about positive benefits of building new, new nuclear reactors because of what happened in South Carolina. I will go back to Mr. Levis, if I'm saying that right, his point that we should have a cookie cutter design. And why are, why are we having all these extra cost in building new nuclear reactors. We're redesigning the wheel every time we uh, get to that point. I don't think Russia and China have that. I think they have settled on one design and they're replicating that over and over. And uh, I believe that price curve bends down at that point. Um, Mr. Levesque, I wanted to ask you, uh, switching gears a little bit, I'm fascinated with uh, those reactors. One particular interest to me is liquid uh, fluoride thorium reactors, a type of molten salt reactor. Do um, you think that's a, a viable future? So uh, the two technologies that TerraPower has chosen to pursue are the traveling wave reactor, which is a um, sodium-cooled reactor, and our molten chloride fast reactor, which is um, a liquid fuel and liquid coolant. So earlier in you know, TerraPower's development, we've I'm out of time. I want to ask you, yeah. is anybody using these type reactors? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, no. You mean the, the thorium base? Yes. Uh, not yet. There's some companies who've chose that as their, their development path. Um, we, we chose uh, molten chloride fast reactor. Five minutes goes in a hurry. Yeah. I yield back. Gentlemen's time is up. The chair now recognizes Mr. Doyle for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. Uh, nuclear power is going to be critical to making sure we meet our 100 percent clean economy goal. Uh, Pennsylvania is the home of the first civilian nuclear power plant in the country. Uh, Pennsylvania knows the importance of being a leader in developing new nuclear technologies and ensuring that our existing fleet continues to provide carbon-free power into the future. Uh, nuclear power already provides Pennsylvania with around 40 percent of its electricity and provides close to 90 percent of our carbon-free power. It's a vital source of clean energy. It provides hundreds of good-paying jobs. It boosts local economies. And while our current fleet continues to provide us power, we are at the beginning of a new era in nuclear power. Advanced nuclear reactors have the potential to pair with renewable energy sources, create energy storage solutions, and help decarbonize industrial manufacturing processes, all while being cheaper, cheaper and safer. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of nuclear power, and I believe we should continue to build on the investments we've made in recent years to advance research, development, and deployment of advanced nuclear reactors to ensure that we remain a global leader in nuclear energy technology and reach our clean economy goals. 
Um, Mr. Hazer, I'd like to start with you. You, you. Your testimony mentioned how advanced nuclear uh, needs to be part of a broader stra strategy for decarbonization and the value it will provide in a system with more and more renewable power. Uh, can you elaborate on the role of advanced nuclear in such a power system and how deployment of these technologies should happen in concert with other technologies like renewables? Thank you for the question. Yes, I, I, I think Mr. Cohen had addressed some of this, but I'll, I'll kind of uh, elaborate on what he said. Basically, um, first of all, we're, as the chairman had indicated, we're seeing an increase in demand for electricity. And with uh, decarbonization of other sectors of the economy, they are moving to decarbonization through various strategies that use more electricity, such as electric vehicles or electrification of industry. So we're seeing increase of demand. We're also seeing the potential for changes in the demand, in the shape of the demand, where the typical cyclical demand structure is based on uh, primarily uh, residential commercial use. And with these other uses now, the demand curve is going to change. And so there's, which is going to increase the need for having more generation such as nuclear that has base load capability that could generate 24 7. And, uh, and so we would see that as being very um, an important element in working with intermittent resources that uh, would, would generate only parts of the day. I think the other key thing that we saw in our review of breakthrough technologies is the importance of long-term duration electricity storage. Right now, we don't have that. Basically, what's being deployed today is typically four to six hours of storage. What we really need is to get to daily storage and, and maybe even seasonal storage. And, and so as those technologies move along, we also need to continue to expand the baseload capability. So we see all of those kind of fitting together and kind of moving forward in, in concert. Thank you. Mr. Merrifield, you noted that in your testimony current nuclear plants face challenging market conditions and advanced reactors aim to get around this problem by using new technology and designs to be cheaper to build and operate. Can you explain these conditions and, and in your opinion, can advanced nuclear technologies become cost competitive with natural gas? And, and if so, when? Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a variety of really good things in that question. Um, one of when, which is the, the cost issues. The advanced reactor developers that are out there right now recognize that they need to meet cost structures that are going to be similar to a combined cycle uh, gas unit. So that really is their target. You get there through modularization, having more of that work done uh, on a factory floor, taking that work out of, uh, out of the field with a stick built. That's what, um, you know, obviously John Hopkins' team at New Scale is doing as well. Um, one of the areas of focus, and I've encouraged the Department of Energy to take a look at this um, in work I'm doing with the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, how do we fix the issue of construction itself? Fully half of the cost of building a nuclear power plant and the issues that they f faced at Summer and Vogel were because of engineering and construction. That's an area that needs a lot of attention and focus. Um, we're doing very well in the development of technologies. We've got a lot of progress we've made on advanced manufacturing, but advanced construction in engineering is going to what's going to be required in, or, in order to enable these technologies. Um, the last part of your question is, is the market structures. I mentioned in my testimony some of the difficulties at FERC right now. Um, there are efforts by uh, your state and others to allow existing nuclear assets to be, uh, to, to stay on with the appropriate financial support because of the reliance, reliability, and resilience they give to the grid. Without changes, if that, those MOPR policies stay, advanced reactors will be put at a disadvantage versus renewables. Um, that needs to change, and I think you all in your oversight of FERC really needs to ask them that hard question. Thank yeah, you. That's a great point. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Ms. McMullis Rogers is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that you're holding this hearing today and recognizing the important role that nuclear must play in our clean energy future. Without utilizing and growing our current nuclear energy capacity, it's impossible for us to achieve significant emissions reductions. We see it playing out in countries like Germany, who are moving away from nuclear power to, uh, due to some advocacy for, from some of the environmental groups. And subsequently, we've seen emissions increase as this steady baseload of power needed is being replaced by coal-fired plants. 
The U.S. has led the world in nuclear energy innovation. But in recent decades, we've started to cede that global leadership. We've also become too dependent on imports of uranium to power our nuclear reactors, reducing our energy security and increasing our dependence on supplies from untr untrustworthy state actors like Russia. To that end, I am pleased that the Trump administration has proposed the creation of a domestic uranium reserve in the most recent budget proposal. We must be doing more to encourage the development and deployment of advanced nuclear technologies. Mr. Levesque, it's great to have you testifying in front of the committee this morning on behalf of TerraPower. We're proud to have you based in Washington State. In your testimony, you discuss how countries like Russia and China are actively supporting the development of advanced nuclear technologies by directly subsidizing state-supported companies. Through this government support, these, these countries are better able to export their technology to other countries, creating decades of dependence on Russia and China to meet their nuclear energy needs. At the same time, you state, quote, no other country has the capacity for innovation and the freedom to think innovatively like the United States. And I couldn't agree more. However, I'm concerned that government red tape and intransigence is setting back our ability to fully realize the potential of our private sector innovation, especially when it comes to exporting our technology to combat the spread of Chinese and Russian influence globally. Would you expand on the current state of global uh, competition in advanced nuclear reactor development, and specifically, how can we as policymakers ensure a regulatory framework that enables companies like TerraPower to compete with state-subsidized companies? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Rogers, and thanks for your support in, in Washington, as, as always. Um, so uh, I agree with all the points you made on the um, state of affairs with, with uh, Russia and China. And earlier, Mr. Hopkins was describing um, the kind of uh, economic benefits that those uh, state-owned companies have as they pursue um, export projects. Uh, but I, I do want to offer uh, innovation and new technology as an opportunity for the United States. Because what you see around the world is uh, other countries are doing uh, quite well at, at copying our old technology. Okay, in, in Pennsylvania in the late 1950s, uh, Congressman Doyle mentioned uh, shipping port was the demonstration reactor for light water reactors. Mm -hmm. That, uh, once we proved that light water reactors could operate at commercial scale, that led to 100 reactors being built in the U.S. and, and more than 400 built around the world based on U.S. born technology. And, and that resulted in these 100-year relationships that American companies had with those countries and those companies. So now as we look at new technology, um, you can see other countries have copied our old stuff and, and are making uh, incremental improvements to it. Uh, innovation is really the American role. We, we're good at it. We're, we're good at uh, managing uh, projects with uh, diverse groups of experts. Uh, I've worked on international projects, and, and I know uh, oftentimes they, they call on the American project manager to put the teams together. Um, it, it happens to be something we're, we're good at. So we need to recognize that, uh, again, because we're, we're getting outnumbered greatly on Gen 3 plants, uh, something like 40 to 1 uh, on new builds around the world, um, and we're uh, facing great challenges that Ms. Korsnick mentioned, uh, keeping our, our Gen 2 plants running because of the, uh, you know, in, incorrect uh, market forces. Um, but we, we need to recognize that advanced reactors and new technology are, you know, America's opportunity to regain nuclear leadership because we're, we're losing it. Do you have anything specific on the regulatory front? On the regulatory front, I think we need to continue what we've started. Um, you know, the NRC's mission is to protect people and the environment, and we respect that. And, um, you know, Congress passed uh, NEMA, the Nuclear Energy uh, Innovation and Modernization Act. I think that was really important for empowering the NRC to change, because without that congressional empowerment and direction to change, um, you know, they, they might not be, you know, free to act with all their stakeholders. So I think it was very important that Congress pass NEMA. And, and I've seen, uh, we've had Chairman Svinicky and, and Commissioner Caputo at TerraPower and meet with their senior management uh, regularly. I can tell the NRC is responding to that. And, and so I think NEMA was, was a very good start. That's great. 
It's always inspiring to hear about American ingenuity. Young lady years back, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel. This is a very interesting topic. I'm learning a lot. Um, in December of last year, the Federal Energy um, Regulatory Commission issued its minimum offer price rule, MOPR, for the PGM, PJM capacity market. And the FERC order, um, as, as you know, targets generation resources that receive a state subsidy. Uh, mostly clean energy projects, including renewables like wind and solar, but also nuclear. And I'm concerned, I know that a lot of people are concerned that this type of market rule could have a negative effect on advanced nuclear projects obtaining financing as well as these other sources of renewable energy. Uh, Ms. Korsnick and possibly Mr. Merrifield, if you'd like to speak to it, um, could you talk to the importance of market rules in clean energy development, specifically in this instance, advanced nuclear project development. And can you discuss the negative impact FERC's MOPR rule might have on the viability of a future advanced uh, nuclear projects? And I know maybe your membership comes with some competing views on this topic, but um, if you could at least speak to some of the concerns, legitimate concerns out there with this rule and then Mr. Merrifield, if you want to offer some comments as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. appreciate the question. Uh, yeah, I would just say fundamentally um, the fact that nuclear is highly reliable as well as carbon-free, uh, fuel secure, you know, these are attributes that are not recognized um, in the marketplace today. And in some cases, the states have decided it's very important to them because they're very interested in uh, the climate, they're very interested um, in uh, being able to contribute uh, in their own way uh, at a state level. And so they've put programs in place to protect their nuclear fleet. Uh, the real challenge that this recent decision by FERC and the minimum offer, offer pricing rule, MOPR, um, has put in place is that it really undoes, uh, if you will, and steps on those states' rights <coughs> where the states have said this is important to us and how we want to have clean energy in our state and essentially it takes that away by taking whatever that credit was and asking the companies then to add that into their bid, likely pushing them out, uh, if you will, of, of the market. So it's, it's a fundamental challenge in the marketplace. Um, and what's the so what of it? Uh, this has to do with the capacity market. Uh, with not going into a lot of details, it could really unwind uh, the capacity market as, as we know it. Uh, today, so it's it's very very important because fundamentally it's talking about the value of those electrons that are produced by these power plants, and you have these advanced reactors. Well, they're going to be playing in some of the same markets, and so it's very important that fundamentally all the positive things that you've heard about nuclear today that the marketplace reflects it. Th uh, thank you. As, as it relates to the, and I I, I completely concur with with Maria's remarks. I think you know as you look at the existing fleet, we have extraordinary capability to produce large amounts of carbon-free power. And to the extent states have made the initiative to say, we think this is important for the people of our state, to have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission put in place a system that essentially is going to knock those systems out and put us further behind the eight ball on controlling carbon emissions is a bad uh, public policy outcome. Uh, as it relates to advanced nuclear, we, we've got work to do. I mean, the, part of the problem is, is us. Our, our, I had one of my associates um, take a look at the a number of interactions that advanced nuclear companies have had with FERC uh, on their websites, less than a handful, right? So uh, the level of attention that the renewable community has given, both wind and solar and others, to FERC has been extraordinary. Our voices haven't been heard. We've been, you know, talking to a lot of other folks, but that's an area where there does need to be focus. I think this committee needs to, to focus on that. We don't want to be in a position where we have the development of these great technologies, but we can't put them into those states because of a market structure that is uh, inappropriately sourced by FERC. Thanks very much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank my friend from Chicago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome to our six expert witnesses. I got to tell you, I'm stunned that it's been decades since America has made a commitment to real new nuclear power. 
We should be ashamed of that. Why? Because nuclear power is CO2 emissions free. In fact, in the 100 minutes I've been sitting here, I've exhaled a lot of CO2, much more than one plant does in 100 years. It's baseload power. It's ready. It's reliable. And it's safe. Hurricane Harvey proved its safety. We have two nuclear power plants in Texas, one up there at Comanche Pass and one there in Bay City, close to my home, uh, the South Texas plant. That plant had the worst part of the Hurricane Harvey hit it. The northeast quadrant is where the storm surge is, the winds are, the rain. Not one blip in the containment room, anything from that power plant. So again, it's safe. And as you know, Mr. Lebec, we have lost two nuclear-powered submarines in our history. We lost the Thresher in 1963 and the uh, Scorpion in 1968. These boats were designed to scram the reactor if they had catastrophic destruction like those subs endured. We've checked out those boats. We know where they sank. It's been almost 70 years now. There has not been one blip of nuclear power from those two reactors. They worked as designed in the ultimate crisis for a naval vessel. So my point is, this is very safe technology as well. And also, new nuclear means lots of good, high-paying jobs. And I want to talk to you about that, Mr. Hopkins. Um, as you probably know, that floor is the first Fortune 500 back in my hometown of Strickland, Texas. We love floor. We're happy that you're a big partner with this, these, these uh, SMR reactors. In your testimony, you talked about around 1,200 new jobs construction per plant. That means heavy equipment operators, welders, electricians, pipe fitters, plumbers, all across the spectrum to build a new power generator, SMR. And FLOOR, as you know, has made an MOU with the North American Building Trades Union for the construction of your nuclear power, your new, new scale plants here in America. Another example, Wharton County Junior College back home has built a campus in Bay City, Texas, right by the South Texas plant to retrain the reactor technicians who are fleeing because they've hit their limit, their ages. Um, can you elaborate on these jobs to be created with the new scale, the, the SMR power, the new your power grids, the little how much jobs created and how this can affect disaster recovery because these things can set up quickly and be running full time in a very short space uh, on the ground as well. You, Mr. Hopkins. Sorry, sir. I thought Not you asked to refer to Mr. Verbo. The, the advanced reactors we're talking about here today are, as you mentioned, three critical components, extraordinarily safe, they got to be economic, and are carbon free. And from a jobs perspective, we're seeing the dynamics in this company change currently, in that the Utah Associated Municipal Power represents uh, power facilities in eight western states have elected to go with a small modular reactor at their first site. And for the job component, as you mentioned, we have a very good relationship with labor. And we need pipe fitters, we need carpenters. And for our first plant, we're normally lock it, looking at about a thousand of these jobs. And as you build them, what we're seeing also, seven states now are going forward with clean energy initiatives. And what we're seeing is in the UM situation, what we're doing, they have a, they're looking at 700 megawatts of coal replacement. Now the coal is not going away for economics, it's their particular facilities, the economics don't currently support it, or they've exhausted the resource. So they have elected to go with small modular reactors, which is us, and if you look at the potential for jobs, in this country, if I, we've just completed analysis from a three to 600 coal facility, as an example, or an aged fossil plant, we can go in and utilize advanced reactors in that existing community to create and cross-train those people working in the advanced reactor community. And it's not that we need four-year degree engineers. What we need is associate's degrees, vocational degrees, and military back experience. So we have just, we've been working with our customer base to get the data to help appreciate how many of those jobs can we in fact in those communities cross-train? And it's quite amazing. The other thing we're seeing here in terms of manufacturing capacity, we have seven forgings required for the new scale module. 
When we started this, there was nobody in this country that could do those forgings for us. Now there's two companies that can do it in this country, and the reason being, they saw market certainty going forward and a sustained capacity for suppliers to get involved in this process. And so it's going to continue to build. So it's high paying jobs, as we mentioned, you know, $85,000 per average. And our ability to go into these communities in small rural communities that need these jobs, <coughs> where, where are they going to be there? Thank you. I'm out of time. One question for you uh, to close, Mr. Levesque. Um, you are a gentlemen's subscriber time. and sub builder. I'm a sub hunter. Gentlemen's time is expired. What does you 31 know, to 7 mean to you, my friend? The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. I thank the chairman, um, and I, I look forward to working with Mr. Duncan on nuclear waste issues uh, in the next term. I thank the witnesses, too, for your, your testimony this morning. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you noticed um, the important role that the market demand plays in uh, nuclear uh, energy competition. I'm just following up on uh, Mr. Sabane's question. Uh, can the government play an important role in creating market demand for nuclear power? Absolutely. And uh, I neglected to mention in my initial um, oral statement what's in our written statement, which is our very, very strong support for the power purchase <coughs> agreement provisions of the NILA bill. Um, there's no way we're going to get off the dime without some sort of, of market pull. So that's, a, that's an important example of that kind of policy that we need. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, from your perspective, how important is it to encourage multiple bills of the same design? Uh, in order to drive costs costs down. Well, in our particular instance, we're employing Sergeant Lundy, which is an engineering firm out of out of Chicago, to do our standard plant design. Now, in terms of an actual standard plant, there will be some nuances contingent upon where we're going to deploy. But the standard plant's a critical piece to be able to drop these costs down significantly. Most of our our components currently are off the shelf. It's a very simplistic design. Our steam generators are, are basically 60 megawatts that are used in the oil field. So that standardization will drive costs down. And also with the ability for our, uh, to build in factories and ship and not to have them all over the location is going to also drive costs down. Well, I worked in industry for uh, 20 years, and when you double production, you lower costs by 10 percent, <laughs> roughly, uh, kind of a rule of thumb. So right. I, I see that taking place here. Uh, Mr. Heiser. Uh, what might the technical breakthroughs in nuclear energy look like? I think we've talked about them today. I think you're looking at two of those companies here represented at the table. There, there right now is, a, is a, an, a large number of new nuclear technologies that are being investigated. And, uh, um, and again, as I indicated in my testimony, a lot of it just with uh, private uh, investment capital and there needs to be a way to bring those forward. I, I think it's a little premature to, right now to say with the advanced reactors, leaving aside new scale for the moment, which ones would be the, if you will, the winner or, or not. But I think as Mr. Cohen said, that the market demand is large enough that, that it does not necessarily need to be a, a, a single winning technology. I think they need some further evaluation because all of these right now are pretty much just being developed on paper. Uh, on that point, I, I travel extensively around the world and I can tell you in, in many other continents, if we had these technologies available to sell and, and deploy in the next several years, there are a number of countries, dozens of countries out there that would buy them. This is a true opportunity for U.S. exports. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, again, judging by your experience at the NRC, do you believe they have sufficient resources uh, to manage the um, uh, licensing requests that they're getting? Yes, sir, I do believe that. It's um, back in 10, 20 years ago when uh, Oregon State University and Dr. Jose Reyes was when DOE approached them, the intent was we're going to build a small modular reactor utilizing light water technology. The reason for that is the regulators around the world know light water technology. Now, having gone through the NRC process, that being said, the NRC really didn't understand small modular reactors in the fact that every, their experience was oriented to the larger scale. Two-thirds of the components for us are, are, not, I mean, of, are not required within a large reactor. 
So there is an educational process. And people say, why did it cost you $500 million? Because we had to do numerous topic reports, numerous exemptions. Our hope is, and what we're doing, we're going to pave the way for the next. I don't view these people in advance as my competitors. I want to see American technology around the world supplanting other foreign entities like China and Russia with extremely safe advanced technology. So yes, the NRC, to Maria's point earlier, we, we went through a, a very long process, but we're seeing their understanding that they're going to have to take a different approach for non-light water. I think in the time remaining, I'd like to ask Mr. Levesque to elaborate on the VTR, the, the virtual training. Sure, uh, sir. The, the versatile test reactor uh, that's currently going through uh, concept design that's driven by uh, Idaho <coughs> National Lab uh, will be a, a neutron irradiation source so that we can test materials and components for advanced reactors. And that's a very important capability for our country to have. Uh, I can tell you I've been to uh, similar facilities in China and Russia. That they have that capability. Uh, we don't. So uh, if we're going to move forward and continue to be the, the leaders in innovating uh, nuclear technology, we need the VTR. Mm. And that's a government I item, or is that a private industry item? Um, that, that began as a government-funded project, uh, but recently um, we were glad to see the, the Department of Energy uh, opened up the VTR as a public-private partnership oh. in several companies, including TerraPower and G Hitachi and en Energy Northwest from Washington came forward with um, suggestions on how to uh, transition the VTR into a public-private partnership. I yield back. That sounds pretty exciting. I yield back. Gentlemen, you yield back. The chair now recognizes that fellow from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, D uh, Doyle back there uh, mentioned a a while ago, maybe a half hour ago on this panel, about the shipping port facility uh, being the first in America. And, and uh, I, interestingly enough, it was under the Eisenhower proposed it in 53, uh, and then they broke ground on it in 54. And then they, they commissioned it by 87. So it just took three or four years to build and less than a year to get a permit. And we've heard how um, in 1979, and I hope there's something more recent, but the CBO did a report on how long does it take to get permits to do a nuclear power plant? Because we saw how the shipping board did it. But in 79, they came out with a very exhaustive report and said that it, then it was 10 to 11 years to get a permit. Uh, and they said prior to that, back in the 60s, that it might take seven to eight years. So it's just, we go from one year to seven to eight, now to 10 to 11 years. It seems like the regulators or whatever the process is, is extending longer and longer. So I know that we've had uh, uh, Rogers, is, is, uh, Kathy Morris Rogers has talked about hydro is 10 years to get a permit. I'm curious, to, what is the length of permit today to start a nuclear power plant? Mr. Hopkins, if I should just go to you, do you have a, do you have a sense of what, what time it takes to get a permit to actually break ground on a nuclear power plant? Well, for us, going to the NRC, we started the process in design certification application in 2016. We'll be through in 2020. And so it was an exhaustive process, and the owner who will have to also apply to go get through their construction operations license will generally take two years beyond that. So I, I think it, it is enhancing. There is a process that's willing to speed it up, but it's... It, it, it's a lengthy process. I mean, well, that, yeah, that's, why, that's why my point, if I can, uh, Mr. Merrifield, um, why I want to drive home, because no one's talked about that. If we're going to drive down the price of nuclear energy and to use more, we've got to streamline the permitting process. It's outrageous, the length of time that it takes. We should be able to do that, because in the past, we were able to accomplish it in a short period of time. And it's no wonder that with Watts, ba Watts Bar, uh, they, how long that took to be able to get the permitting through that and increase the price of their $12 billion to build those two units up. And the vocal unit, uh, the Southerns put out $25 billion. And think about it, that's almost 12 years for the permitting process for them to go to that extent. We've got to find a way to shortening this, this permitting process. So I'm curious, are we missing something on this? What is, what is a way? Is it because we know, maybe more pointedly, 
there are opponents out there to nuclear energy. Primarily, I guess it would be environmentalists. I don't know how else to categor categorize them, but let's just say people. That, what's the problem? Why do we have, why is this dragging out? So, Merrifield, if you could, what's the problem? Why, didn't, why do the environmentalists have such an, an angst when it comes to nuclear energy? When we know it's well, we know it's pure, we know it's clean, and if that's their objective to get us down to where we have low emissions, zero emissions, carbon emissions, why in God's name aren't they supporting that to be able to achieve that? Well, I, I, I'm going to look at it positively. I mean, there are I think there's probably 10 percent of the American people who are dead set against nuclear power. The, there are a number of leading environmentalists who have made a more recent decision that, given the importance of addressing global climate change, that they reversed their position on, on nuclear power and now for it. Uh, Carol Brown, a friend of mine, uh, she and I used to spar <laughs> in the Senate back when she worked for Al Gore and I worked uh, in the Senate Environment Committee. Uh, she was not someone who, who was supportive of nuclear power at that time, but today uh, she recognizes it's a critically important piece for us to deal with, with this issue. To your question about uh, the permitting process, there's no question that the track record that the NRC has had in the past has not been uh, what it should be in terms of getting these reactors approved. Uh, GE, with its uh, um, ESBWR reactor, took 10 or 11 years to be permitted by the NRC, not, not the right way to do it. I think they've made a significant amount of progress. They're, they're looking at a more risk-informed program, recognizing that these reactors have a much reduced um, source term, amount of uh, radiation that could be re reduced. Uh, they made a, a very good decision recently uh, relative to the Clinch River site. That if, I, if I can interrupt one thing, because the uh, time is limited on this. You, re, you mentioned about the spent fuel rods, with how we can store them someplace, wherever, uh, against uh, the quantity and how safe it's been. That's, you talk about in America, it's safe. Yep. But what happens in a, overseas, in an unfriendly nation that potenti potentially could have access to spent fuel rods? How safe is that? Um, uh, is a general matter, and this is this is overseen or, or, or uh, clarified by the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in Vienna. Uh, there are international standards and expectations for how that fuel is going to be stored, whether it's in a spent fuel pool uh, or in, in dry cast storage. Um, U.S. has exported uh, uh, reactor uh, has ex exported CAX technologies all over the world. Uh, the fuel from the Chernobyl reactors is being stored in Holtec. Uh, dry storage canisters are originated from the United States. So I, I feel um, the, the technology, it's not complicated, uh, and it is well run. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, the chairman of the subcommittee on environment, Mr. Tucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and welcome to our uh, panel. Um, as you all heard, our committee is working on economy-wide decarbonization. One of the biggest challenges will be clean sources of heat for industrial applications. So, Mr. Cohen, how can advanced nuclear be complementary to efforts to decarbonize the industrial sector? Well, there are at least two ways that, uh, two ways that um, nuclear can do that. First is provision of direct heat. I, I mentioned some of this in my written testimony. Um, there is experience with higher temperature reactors that can meet the temperature requirements of a steel plant or a cement plant. Um, so there's, uh, there's the, that capability. The other capability that was mentioned earlier is the ability to uh, produce very, very efficient electrolysis uh, processes that produce hydrogen. The hydrogen then can then be burned for industrial heat. So you have two avenues where nuclear could be extremely uh, important for decarbonization. And that's important because industrial heat and process is about 20 percent of global emissions of CO2. Thank you. And can small modular reactors be sited near facilities that will need clean thermal energy? Certainly. I, I, I know these gentlemen have, have looked more at the site specifics, but um, obviously there's a, an opportunity to couple um, uh, nuclear reactors directly to the industrial sources that need them, and you, you gain greater efficiency that way. Yeah, one, one, of the, one of the benefits you can have is with this very high heat, you can pair that with, with, a, molten, with a molten salt, a, a solar molten salt, which has no radiation to it, and you can transport that three, four, five miles with a very small reduction in, in efficiency. So there is a lot of creativity that advanced reactors allow for manufacturing processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Hezer, uh, any additional thoughts on how these um, solutions may open up opportunities across sectors? 
Well, cross sectors, I think we just touched on one right now, which is the industrial one. And um, um, uh, clearly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with changes in demand for electricity and changes in the, uh, in the load curve due to things like electrification of transportation, um, there will definitely be a need for more uh, generation that has 24-7 uh, capabilities such as uh, advanced nuclear. So there's a very close connection there. I think in the case of buildings, it's, it's, a, little, uh, it's a little more uncertain right now uh, how far uh, one might go in terms of electrification of buildings. Uh, there's some more difficult trade-offs there. Um, and some of the technologies, particularly for electric heat, really need much more innovation than what we're currently seeing. But clearly in industry and transportation, there's a very um, a good set of uh, synergies there with, uh, with advanced nuclear. Thank you. And I'm very interested in maintaining the United States' excellence in STEM. Continuing our, our U.S. leadership in nuclear engineering and physics starts in our schools and higher education systems. Uh, if nuclear energy goes away, we could see many of these programs follow. So, Ms. Korsnick, how important are these educational programs for innovation in advanced nuclear, and what role should the federal government play in supporting nuclear-related STEM education and training uh, for the next generation of reactor designers and plant operators? Well, thanks for the question. Um, I think education is critical. And uh, when we talk about uh, U.S. leadership, um, the education program that we have here is an example of, le of U.S. leadership. And the engineers that we'll need uh, for these, they're not all nuclear engineers. Uh, there's a variety of disciplines. Uh, we have excellent schools here in the United States, not only at the collegiate level, um, but as the uh, secondary school programs uh, as well. And it's absolutely critical that we maintain our focus on STEM uh, to produce that workforce of the future. Uh, sure. One thing I, I use as an example, um, we have two individuals, Jake DeWitt and Carolyn Cochran, a, a husband and wife duo, both doctors from, from uh, MIT, who have the first reactor design, uh, Oklo, 1.5 megawatts that will, will be advanced reactor put in front of the NRC. These are people that came out of U.S. University, created those ideas, and are putting it to work. That is really a demonstration of where advanced nuclear is going. Thank you very much. And does everyone agree that there are potential federal policies, for example, carbon pricing, that would correct market failures and reward the zero emissions generation of nuclear, which is not currently recognized by markets? Um, anyone? Absolutely. Uh, the Smith Lujan bill is one example of that, um, that which sets a, a clean energy standard, which, by the way, has been adopted now in six states, um, and several others are considering uh, that would. Uh, move um, power sector emissions down to zero carbon over a period of, of, of decades. So that's an example of a policy. That and we would something have. like that help the competitiveness of existing nuclear? W w I, I, these gentlemen would have their own opinion. I think any economist would say yes. And, and I would just add that um, a, a carbon pricing policy such as a carbon tax would also accomplish the same thing as a clean energy standard in terms of creating that uh, um, additional incentive for nuclear to, would price in the, the, uh, the clean energy attributes of it. Uh, I would also just add that I, I know that uh, Secretary Moniz has recently uh, stated his support for carbon tax, but also in the context of combining it with a uh, tax and dividend program so that we address the social equity issues that might be associated with a carbon tax. Thank in, you very I was just going to, in the jurisdiction of your subcommittee, um, one of the other fixes that could be made is the Clean Air Act currently does not allow nuclear power plants that have power up rates to qualify for, for NOx and SOx trading. That is a change that, that your subcommittee could initiate that would enhance the ability to, to have more power generation from existing units. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, you expect the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from the great state of Virginia, Mr. Griffin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. We're having a, a good discussion. Um, I do appreciate uh, Secretary Moniz. Uh, he was one of the few folks in the Obama administration that I thought really tried to think through problems for Central Appalachia and not just look at uh, one size fits all. And uh, you just made mention of that in your comments about his thoughts in relationship to uh, taxes, which I probably won't support, 
but but if we're going to do it, let's make sure we're not crippling an already economically distressed area that I happen to represent, as does Mr. McKenna. So I appreciate his uh, always looking out uh, for the long term and for the facts that uh, mm -hmm. you, you can't change one part of the formula without hurting somebody. Let's make sure we protect people. Right. Th thank you for your comment. I'll make sure I pass that along. Yeah, he, well, you know, he's just he's got to be delightful to work for. One of the one of the brightest individuals I have met. Uh, up here in D.C. Just a great guy. Uh, that being said, nuclear power plants, like my coal-fired power plants, are robust structures that can reliably provide much-needed electricity during extreme weather events. For example, nuclear plants continued to operate during extreme cold caused by the polar vortex, and hurricanes like Harvey in Houston and Maria in Puerto Rico showed how long it can take to bring electricity back to impacted areas where solar farms were destroyed uh, in the severe wind. I actually saw that in when we went down to visit Puerto Rico afterwards. You know, one of the solar farms survived without a scratch, and the other one was just totally twisted and torn up. Uh, you still have to have, of course, a grid to connect it to. But, Mr. Merrifield, how could small modular reactors also continue to provide power in extreme weather events such as polar vortexes and hurricanes? Well, th thank you for asking that. I'm actually um, uh, part of a project called the, the Nuclear Alternative Project is looking at the possibility of putting in small modular and advanced reactors in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. for that very purpose, recognizing the, the issues and challenges that occurred. Um, we've completed the first phase of that study. We're waiting potentially to get a second phase awarded um, by Idaho National Labs. But the report clearly indicated that nuclear power generation facilities could have assisted Puerto Rico in working their way through that, and, and we certainly believe it would be uh, important in that regard. Uh, a number of hurricanes have demonstrated the, the reliability that nuclear power uh, provides in that regard, and, and, and I think it's well, well said. Uh, in terms of the polar vortex, I mean, I'm originally from New, New Hampshire. Uh, we call it uh, Ap uh, Appalachia, not Appalachia. But the point being, Seabrook Station Nuclear Power Plant was a critical resource for New England in making sure that that grid stayed up during that vortex. And I do have to remind folks, Canada particularly Ontario, which is 100 percent carbon free because of their principally their nuclear assets and some hydro, recognizes that for that part of North America, uh, nuclear is, is critically important as well. So you've, you've pointed out very well, it, they are absolutely critical assets in making sure our grid stays stable. And following up on that, I, I like to bring up microgrids, and I think Puerto Rico is a, a great test bed for, Puerto, for uh, microgrids. Do you see scenarios where small modular reactors could be connected to a microgrid? in a situation like Puerto Rico or in central Appalachia if, if we're cut off from the rest of the a world absolutely, by storms. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that is a, a specific issue that we're looking at relative to Puerto Rico. Um, a lot of folks don't recognize the importance that Puerto Rico plays, particularly these days, in the supply of pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and, and medical equipment. If you go to the northern part of the island, there's a series of manufacturing facilities for those uh, petro for those chemical uh, for those uh, drugs and, and other pharmaceuticals. Having well-placed small modular nuclear reactors in those locations could well provide a difference between providing those necessary drugs or not having that provided in the event of a, of a catastrophic emergency. And, and it would certainly be good to have a secure location to be producing some of those things, whether it be drugs or oxygen or, or, or things that the, the, the bags that hold various uh, uh, medical uh, devices or items that we need. and. Uh, could be have it on, on American soil. No, you make, you make a great point, and, and I think one of the things we really haven't talked about today, which is critically important, is the work that the U.S. military is doing right now in looking at the potential for deploying modular reactors for forward operating locations that would use many of these same technologies to make sure that we had reduce the number of our troops who are, who are killed, trying to transport liquids, and really f provide the opportunity for enhanced laser and, and, uh, and other weapon systems that will that will project the, the force of the future. I appreciate that very much, and I have just an, another second, not enough time to get another question off, so I will, I will save those for the, the written follow-up questions that uh, the committee often offers us the opportunity to do. Appreciate you all being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this important hearing. Thank you. Mr. the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from, Cali from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for having this hearing today. Thank you to the panel for being here. It's um, most uh, I've felt I've gotten a lot of information from you today that uh, is going to ask more and more questions for the future. But uh, our nation's existing power 
nuclear power fleet uh, produces clean energy uh, for power for many communities. In fact, Arizona's Palo Verde Generating Station is the largest nuclear energy producer in the country, producing almost 80 percent of Arizona's clean electricity to over 4 million customers. While Arizona continues to grow its power generation from solar and hydro, today's hearing has informed us how smaller nuclear reactors of the future may develop to serve rural and underserved communities which cl with clean and affordable power. While the U.S. imports almost 90 percent of its enriched uranium for nuclear power, and most of that comes from Canada today, uh, we cannot forget the toxic env environmental contamination that has devastated the Navajo Nation from domestic uranium mining for nuclear power during the Cold War. This has been left over, has left over 520 abandoned mine sites on Navajo land to this day. I think it would be helpful if the industry helped us pressure our government to make sure that area gets clean. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, in, in your testimony, you state that uh, small modular reactors are well positioned to replace aging coal-fired power plants. I have three more to go. I just lost Navajo the, uh, uh, last year. Uh, providing continued employment for workers and tax revenue for the community. Uh, I'll, go, I I'll stop the other paragraph, but I guess in scale, uh, Navajo Generation st Station, I have school districts, I have fire districts, I have cities and towns uh, and counties, uh, the state. Uh, everybody lost a tremendous amount, not, not to mention the 400 jobs that were lost also. How do you envision this, the tax structure of uh, that scale of a plant, a nuclear plant, to the scale of a coal generation plant in ab ability to understand what the, the tax level is going to be potentially? Well, I, I mentioned earlier, sir, that we had just completed a study that dealt with aging fossil fuels for us to be able to, or the advanced community, to go in there and retrain those people in those jobs. And I'll be licensed this year. I mean, we're in the process right now, particularly working with uh, the CEO of uh, U Utah Associated Municipal Power to go out and have discussions, as you as the Navajo Nation, and what's occurring, and the opportunity for small mod reactors to, in fact, go in there and redeploy and recross train those people in your community. Yeah, um, Congressman, I mean, to answer part of that question, the, the tax base is typically okay. a thousand megawatt nuclear power plant is going to be taxed at a much higher rate than a thousand megawatt coal unit. And so I think to the extent you're able to replace uh, some of those coal units with nuclear facilities, they're going to probably be taxed at, at, at a higher rate due to their technological capabilities. Uh, Mr. Merrifield, uh, I guess, uh, do you see any barriers that specifically limit the potential development of small modular reactors in rural communities? In rural communities? Um, no, I think, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that this industry has had to do, and, and certainly we appreciate the work that Congress and administration have done as well, that is to educate people in the kind of discussions we've been having today. And, and, and we know full well that there are some folks who don't fully appreciate these technologies, and we need to have a dialogue. We really need to, to help uh, work with them to better understand it. Um, I come from a rural town. I grew up in a town of 2,000 people. Um, I, I recognize that, that those areas um, may not be as familiar but many, many of the nuclear power plants that we have in America, including the very fine Palo Verde station, are in rural America, and I don't see there being an issue uh, overall with, with putting those reactors in those locations. You, it's a good point you bring up because the, going through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, one of the area of focus, exactly what you're talking about, is the reduction of the so-called emergency planning zone, which typically is a 10-mile radius. Tennessee Valley Authority use the new scale methodology and calculations for Clinch River to go before the NRC, and the findings were that, assuming everything what we say is going to be accurate, that the emergency planning zone could in fact be reduced close to site boundary limits, which is a significant cost reduction and also allows us to go in closer to communities as facilities and population density have grown up to be able to utilize that site. Thank you very much, and I yield, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, 
Mr. Flores for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, all of you uh, joining us for this. This is uh, a hugely important issue. Uh, this is the only uh, dispatchable base load energy source that we have is zero emissions, and so I appreciate your involvement with that. We've talked about several issues today, including financing, foreign competition, waste, fuel availability, the regulatory environment, licensing environment. I want to spend my time talking about fuel with Ms. Korsnick and, and uh, Mr. Merrifield, but that'll be in a minute because Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Levesque, you all brought up some things that I hadn't really thought about, and that is uh, the talent pool uh, for the next generation, well, for the nuclear industry in general, for the next generation nuclear industry, uh, and also the supply chain. Can each of you spend about 30 seconds talking about the challenges with those two issues? Again, supply chain and, and talent pool. Sure. Uh, you know, one strong point I, I'd like to make um, in the area of talent is that's yet another reason we have to get back into demonstrating the new technologies. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, what talented, uh, especially the young people, we have people of, of all demographics at, at Terra Power, but uh, sometimes we worry about the young people the most. Uh, we, we're a 13-year-old company, and, and some of our great minds joined the company um, thinking that we would be building reactors by now. And we really need to create U.S. projects or our great talent is, is going to leave the field of nuclear energy. Okay. And how about the, the supply chain? What, what, Mr. Hopkins, why don't you talk about supply chain? Yes, sir. Uh, what we're supply. finding is um, we, we, in terms of, what, what, just to comment quickly, we've been engaged with over 17 universities and laboratories through this process over 20 years. We find that the being able to go into these universities it's an amazing opportunity of the Brain Trust to be able to tackle areas such as energy requirements for desalinization, energy requirements for hydrogen. Also, from a supply chain perspective, as I, as I said earlier, we lost a lot of that capacity. Right. And to get that capacity back, there needs to be market certainty. What we're finding within the suppliers, as I mentioned, we're in 25 states now with, with our suppliers. And could we build 12 of these right now with our capacity? Absolutely. But we have to be able to mass produce them because for us, it's not building a one-off plant. It's going to be multiple plants concurrently. Sure. And so we need to continue to build up that supply chain. And what we're finding also, this is a global play. This is going to be a global market. So our ability for, for suppliers to understand there's market certainty and we're going to spend the money to tool up to accommodate what you need, that they have an opportunity to go internationally with all of us. Thank you. Uh, Earlier this year, or, or excuse me, last year, this uh, committee and, and also the House passed uh, my bill that I introduced along with Mr. McNerney of California. They advanced a Nuclear Field Availability Act to, in order to have a uh, public-private partnership to produce ISA low enriched uranium. Um, Mr. Merrifield and Ms. Korsnick, I have a question for each of y'all. Mr. Merrifield, what are the civilian, military, and space needs for HALU, both in the United States and abroad? Um, first of all, I want to I want to thank you for the leadership that you've taken on on Halu and certainly the leadership of this committee in moving that forward. We we certainly hope that your Senate counterparts um, move expeditiously. Yeah. The, the yeah. elements of your bill that will, will fund the ability to look at a lot of those transportation issues are, are critically important. Those aren't included in some of the other bills, and so we really think this needs to move forward. Um, having said that, we are looking right now at at both military uses, both domestically and and potentially locating those outside of the United States as well as space utilization of, of, of high assay LEU. Uh, those, we do have some inventory in, in, in our government to, to produce, uh, to supply some of that, but long term, we are at a disadvantage as a country because of an inability to produce high assay LEU that can be used for those right. purposes or other military needs. So this is a critically important function. The Department of Energy has moved forward on, on centrifuges with Centris. Uh, that needs to move forward. Ms. Korsnick, uh, as your members look to the future and to uh, the adoption of, of next generation nuclear, um, what are some of the issues that DOE and the NRC need to work on in order to uh, move forward with HALU? So. And as he just mentioned, um, yeah, some of these next generation reactors are going to use that that higher assay um, LEU. It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. I know. Uh, once there's enough market signal, then the market will respond um, and uh, go ahead and, and create uh, enrichment that will do this. Uh, but before that market signal is sent, it's too much uncertainty 
And so why would you make that investment? So this is the case where I think the government very much can step in and create that bridge where they can supply interim, uh, some high assay LEU, while there then is that signal that's sent and give the, um, the market a chance uh, to build uh, the necessary supply. Also higher enriched, think about it, not only do you have to make it, you gotta get it to where you wanna use it. Exactly. So there's transportation, there's permitting, there's regulation. Right now, it's all really centered on the fuel that we use today, which is 5% and less enriched. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you go higher than that, there needs to be a broader infrastructure. And that is something that we are working on with our members, but we would, uh, we'll need NRC uh, as well as government uh, support for making that happen. I also made additional questions to ask you all to uh, supply uh, <coughs> that to the record. Mr. Cohen, I have a question about the impact of the environmental, I'm, I'm out of time, but the yeah. environmental impact of the battery storage for the 3.3 terawatts that, yeah. that we need. The, the, gentleman we'll that back. the gentleman you asked back, the chairman now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Schreiner, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, can uh, decarbonization of our power sector be achieved without the use of uh, the nuclear sector? As a logical matter, yes. I think as a practical matter, probably not. I mean, there are other options, but again, as I showed you, they're extremely expensive and probably unlikely to be implemented at that scale. Ms. Korsnick, would you agree with that? I would say we can't do it without nuclear. Okay, very good, all right. Uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, uh, Mr. Hopkins, uh, uh, thank you for all the work you're doing, your company. Uh, I uh, appreciate the work in our home state of Oregon and you know, forward thinking and all the hoops you've had to go through, the $500 million uh, in fees. Uh, so can you describe a little bit uh, how significant it is for the first of a kind technology like this to get through the marketplace and through the regulatory framework uh, on time and uh, on budget? How important uh, the cost sharing of the funding was to your success at this point? Uh, sir, it's absolutely critical. We, we, there's no room to fail you here. The industry as general has not been able to meet the obligations for the most part on cost and schedule. When we build this first plant, it's gotta be on time, on schedule. The other is that a lot of the countries and companies that we're in discussions with don't necessarily wanna be first. That doesn't say I have to build a 12 module plant, but they wanna see one module up and running so we can showcase internationally. Very good. Well, you know, in, in our own home state, uh, nuclear's had a checkered history uh, for a variety of uh, good and sometimes not so good reasons, if I may say so. Uh, talk a little about uh, nuclear waste vis-a-vis uh, -vis SMRs and uh, what opportunities there are perhaps in dealing with nuclear waste as a result of the SMR technology and other advanced nuclear technologies. Having looked at, as example, the Trojan facility in the state of Oregon, it's been um, oh, 17 years now, when you go out there and you look at the rigor of what interim storage has done, um, people who have gone out there and have told me, I don't have a concern anymore about waste. But I think what I mentioned earlier about unused energy, there is some of these new waves of advanced reactors are gonna be able to use that for their fuel source. So it's an interim storage currently today, but no telling what could happen future state when some of these come online and use that as their future energy source. Mr. Levesque, would you agree with that? I, I definitely agree, Congressman. I, I think um, you need to begin with um, what uh, Mr. Merrifield described with uh, you know, the great story on how little volume there is of used nuclear fuel given that nuclear energy's uh, you know, powered uh, you know, millions and millions of homes for, for decades. There's no smokestack. It's, it's a very small sm amount of uh, use nuclear fuel that, that's tracked very closely. But if you think about new technologies um, like ours, we have the potential to reduce that waste stream by 80%. So taking a, a good story and, and reducing that waste stream by 80%. And, and that's accomplished by um, things like, uh, we, we call it advanced physics. You know, the computer models that we have today, uh, you know, no, no secret, some of this has been funded by Bill Gates, that shouldn't surprise people, allow you to design a core that burns the fizzle material much, much more completely. So at the end of the, at the, end of the day, when, when the plant is, is ready to be uh, shut down, you've cut your waste by 80%. And uh, also, uh, there's even chances to use nuclear fuel. The, the DOE is starting to look at you know, whether we should use some of that fizzle material that's in used nuclear fuel. And, and advanced reactors just open up many different um, fuel cycle possibilities that if we're not moving forward with advanced reactors, 
we're, we're not really innovating on the fuel cycle either. Mr. Murfield, quick comment. No, I, I, he, I think uh, Mr. Lebeck has captured that well. All right. Last question, Mr. Hopkins, uh, and I guess this could be for anybody. How can nuclear energy, uh, even SMRs, compete with the low cost of natural gas in this day and age? Some of what we talked about earlier, we, we looked at our market predominantly is in, and still today, a significant amount of energy or international. A lot of it has to do with movement towards climate disruption and energy security. But what we're seeing again are states that are gravitating to a clean air initiatives. The state of Washington, I just mentioned, in fact, where Energy Northwest uh, commissioned a study called uh, E3, where they basically said, in fact, they named New Scale in that study as potential non greenhouse gas emitter uh, to, as, as an alternative. And they also looked at could we, in fact, in, in an entire state do it with renewables? And they found you're going to have to have both. Mr. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I, I would. Let me just let me just add. I, I think the other issue is when you look at a nuclear power plant, it has to account for the cost of the plant, the cost of the decommissioning plan, and the cost for taking care of the fuel. If you compare that with a natural gas plant, and that is the bogey for a lot of these technologies, decommissioning costs are not built in, and there's no accounting for the fifty the the, the amount of carbon that's released in the atmosphere, which is a pollutant, frankly. Thank you. My time has expired. I appreciate it very much. The gentleman you expect, the chair now recognizes Mr. Wallenberg for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the panel as well. It's been interesting and uh, appreciated the last line of questioning also about the nuclear waste. Um, uh, it's being used already in other places and we have to find ways uh, to go past the political issues to get the right thing done. Uh, also coming from the state of Michigan now, which is on a very aggressive, aggressive uh, goal track toward uh, uh, zero carbon, uh, it isn't going to happen without having nuclear as part of that mix. I, I certainly haven't seen that as well. Um, Ms. Korsnick, uh, while we're focusing this morning on advanced reactors, um, there are innovations underway uh, that can assist the existing fleet, at least I hope there are. Uh, having uh, the DTE, Fermi 1, Fermi 2 in my district and hanging on to a license for Fermi 3, that's debatable when and if they'll use it, uh, but the capability certainly is there. Would you talk about uh, the development and regulation of accident tolerant fuels? Specifically, what are the safety and operational and performance benefits of these fuels and what is the status of deployment? And then second, how will development of these fuels help the development of advanced reactors? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I would say advanced or accident tolerant fuel um, is a, a great innovation uh, for the industry. In some of the cases, it's going to be able to operate uh, in a way that these plants can run longer uh, between outages. So you can think um, if they're placed in current uh, operating reactors that it uh, allows them some flexibility relative to their schedule, um, and that actually could help reduce uh, costs uh, overall. In, um, we've already actually started to test uh, some of this, and mm. uh, we in, uh, put some accident tolerant fuel in an operating reactor. It was just recently removed, um, and now that will be uh, tested and analyzed. Uh, so I would say uh, absolutely things are moving forward. There's um, future investment uh, that is being looked for uh, for, again, uh, public-private partnership uh, type things to advance uh, accident tolerant fuel. But this also is laying the groundwork for new fuel technologies that can be used um, in advanced reactors. Any, any other insight on what's necessary to accelerate um, uh, progress in this area? I'm thinking of DTE, Fermi 2 now having a major shutdown coming. That will be ex extensive in the number of, of, of days, weeks that it will be out. Um, how do we accelerate the progress on these fuels? Yeah, well, it generally comes down to money. Uh, and so I know that there's companies that are very interested um, in accident tolerant fuel and investing in that. Uh, but that's an area uh, that we look to for um, additional investment. Uh, on, on that notion, uh, uh, Congressman, you know, that's another area where high assay, low enriched uranium is going to be important. 
Um, there are uh, technologies uh, underway right now, Lightbridge has one, where they want to use uh, HALU in order to power that future uh, fleet, I the existing reactors, uh, and that, 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 that fuel also has uh, extreme uh, capabilities to, to deal with accent tolerance. So a lot of these things weave together, but that uh, a very important point in that regard. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ms. Korsnick, you reference in your testimony uh, subsequent license renewals. Um, why is this important for the existing fleet? Well, it's critically important. These plants uh, initially were given a, a license of, of 40 years, and, um, and since uh, we have really operated these plants extremely well, in fact, I would say the United States is the premier operator of nuclear plants around the world. And as part of operations, we've changed out components, we've analyzed things, uh, we've taken extremely good care of these plants, um, and in analyzing those, looked at possible license extension. We have gone from 40 years to 60 years, almost the entire fleet, uh, and now most recently have gained approval to go from 60 years uh, to 80 years. And uh, again, very safely, uh, everything's been monitored. There's additional um, inspections that you put in place. I would say there's nothing magic about 80 years. It's a matter of monitoring correctly and, um, and, and operating these plants uh, with the ultimate safety that they are. Well, maybe there's a future for yucca yet. <laughs> so thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Delaware, Ms. Brunt Rochester, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses here today. Uh, prior to being elected to Congress, I served as Delaware Secretary of Labor and also uh, as the head of state personnel for state government. And I know that the workforce is the lifeblood of any organization or any industry. And because of this, I recently launched the House Bipartisan Future of Work Caucus so that we can proactively be ready for the changing jobs that we inevitably face in our growing economy. So I want to start there. Um, Ms. Korsnick, one of the issues that we need to keep in mind with industry transitions is ensuring that the workforce is also transitioning. Are there people trained and ready to work in an advanced nuclear industry? And can you speak to the workforce demands for building and operating advanced nuclear technologies at a large scale? Sure, thank you. Um, so your question about uh, transitioning uh, the workforce, and I would say much of uh, the workforce that we have today would be used in building these. And just look at the type of workforce that we use to build uh, the Vogel plant. And so many of it comes from the trades um, as well as the engineers from the technical side. Uh, I just don't want there to be the view that when we talk about building something advanced that it means all four-year degrees because it doesn't. And, um, and so I think there's the capability of us to put that in play. But let's be honest, when the Vogel plant was being built, they were very much challenged to find all of the talent that they need. And so we have to look hard um, at, at this pipeline if we were to do um, a large build. On the positive side, these things, and they were mentioned earlier, are going to be more factory built. And so that should be helpful in getting to that nth of a kind and getting, uh, if you will, quickly uh, up, to, up to speed. So we have the capability, we have the talent, and I think there's some good pipelines uh, and training programs that can be put in place. And, and as a follow-up to that, um, are there substantial opportunities for workers who are displaced from, from fossil fuel industries to transition into advanced nuclear? Absolutely. Um, just think about the plants when we initially built. We got uh, folks that work from the fossil um, side. The entire secondary side of a plant looks the same, whether you're fossil, whether you're nuclear. And so all of that talent can be redeployed. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, uh, while nuclear energy is carbon free in terms of generation, emissions from plant construction and spent nuclear fuel management must also be considered. Uh, what are the differences in terms of environmental impact between advanced nuclear technology and uh, conventional nuclear re reactors? And I I'll just add on to this. Um, uh, how does advanced nuclear technology address the environmental concerns of conventional uh, nuclear plants? So there are two different questions there. Um, I, I think that on, in terms of the, f the footprint, let's put aside the, um, the issue of, um, of uh, out at the output. The, um, the, uh, the, international, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change looked at the total CO2 emissions footprint of various power resources, including the entire life cycle from construction to mining. 
uh, nuclear came out, I mean, it's barely detectable on the, on the chart. You know, it's like orders of magnitude lower than anything else. So, I mean, every, every, any time you, you, know, you build anything, you're going to have, you know, impacts. But I, I think this maybe the second part of your question was perhaps safety and safety related. Yeah, Is that where you're more, going? More related to the, the um, uh, addressing the environmental concerns. You know, I think that the, this has been addressed, I think, extensively in the testimony, but there are, and including my own, there are about five or six attributes of these various reactors that suggest an, an accidental release of radiation would be vastly diminished uh, as compared to a conventional reactor, which is not to say that conventional reactors are problematic, but uh, this we're, we're talking about step changes in safety. Great, thank you. And Mr. Hopkins, um, small modular reactors are being designed with a whole new generation of digital instrumentation and controls compared to the nuclear plants operating today. Uh, how can we ensure that these reactors will, uh, be, will not be vulnerable to cyber threats? Yes, we actually just recently completed a study both on cybersecurity and the impact of an electromagnetic uh, pulse on our plants. And working with a company called Ultra Electronics, uh, we've devised and went through the NRC a digital uh, instrumentation control process that doesn't hook to the internet. It's on a programmable, a programmable array. And so we believe strongly that from a cyber perspective, we're pretty secure. Thank you. In fact, we wrote a paper on it recently, if you have an interest. Thank you so much, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady <coughs> yields back the balance of her time. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I apologize for not being here earlier. Uh, we had a bipartisan meeting down at the White House on coronavirus, uh, and uh, anyway, it was a very productive meeting as we are working uh, together. So uh, I have, so I missed your testimony. Uh, I won't ask you to give it again, <laughs> uh, but I do have a couple of questions. Uh, in Michigan, Two of our major utilities have announced goals to reduce carbon emissions by 80 and 90 percent by 2040. Good thing. And for states like us, the loss of nuclear generation certainly makes it harder to meet those goals, and costs and delays in transmission siting for wind and solar may slow the deployment of other renewables. So Mr. Merrifield and Mr. Korsnick, can you speak to the importance of preserving the existing generation and the electricity reliability benefits of doing so, and do you think that state officials and other policymakers, in fact, are getting the message? Um, the answer is yes, absolutely critical. Uh, if we're to meet uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions mm -hmm. targets, we're, we're going to have to keep these plants and keep them for a long period of time. They operate safe. They operate in, in a 92-plus percent capacity factor. They are critical national assets. Um, I think uh, many states uh, get that message. There are some that still don't. Um, California, for example, is shutting down two perfectly good nuclear power plants at Diablo Canyon, which frankly is a, is a crying shame. Um, but I think we need to make sure, and this committee needs to oversee uh, efforts on the part of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and make cer certain that they're not undertaking policies that put nuclear at a disadvantage. Ms. Korsnick? I would just say, um, you know, many of the utilities that are making pledges that directionally get them uh, to carbon free, whether it's 2040, 2045, 2050, they notionally can have an appreciation to get maybe 60 or 70 percent. But that last piece, you have to have dispatchable carbon free energy. And it's really the partnering of uh, that, like a nuclear plant with the uh, wind and solar that ultimately is the answer. And that's going forward. So if you start closing down your nuclear plants, you're just digging a deeper hole upon which to get out. So it's absolutely critical that you maintain the current fleet. I, I offered some math earlier. It's, it just think of this round number. If you retired you, the U.S. nuclear fleet, you'd lose about a decade in your effort uh, the, the, the in the pace you need for to decarbonize the grid. It's, it's pretty simple. It's a big, it's a big thing to lose. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Hopkins. You talked about placing your units at the site of former coal facilities. Obviously, that's going to reduce the need for new transmission siting, uh, which has been an issue as we look particularly at 
renewables and you know taking places in the desert and places uh, other places where you think that it would be uh, pretty good as it relates uh, to solar uh, how do you address the question that coal plants and other facilities were not cited uh, for nuclear as well I'm sorry sir what was the end of that question <clears throat> so you talk about using this existing right. siting uh, for coal so would that not be a good place uh, to look at renewables and use that those same transmission lines uh, for those facilities? Oh, yes, sir. I mean, renewables, it, we, in fact, we wrote a paper on, and it was mentioned throughout this analysis, what we talked about today, advanced reactors in renewables complement one another. If I look at, you know, currently, I, I've built offshore wind farms, we built PV solar, and you have capacity factors of 25 to 30 percent. Generally today, it's augmented by natural gas, which is fine, but some of these states that are gravitating to non-greenhouse gas emissions, small modular reactors are a natural to assist in load following. So they, in fact, could go there, but we're also saying that we could complement renewables. So the last question I have is, as we look at coronavirus and the impact it has uh, on so many different things, including the supply chain, as we look for uh, material that is coming from China, whether it be solar panels or other things, how is there been any analysis in the last just couple weeks as it relates to this uh, for, for uh, deployment here in the U.S.? Has anyone got any numbers or any? I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have numbers. I have spoken to utility clients as recently as Sunday who said that they had uh, wind assets that were being sourced in China uh, that have been delayed as a result of, of the coronavirus. So it clearly, it clearly is impacting the energy supply chain today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, years back, and now the chair, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. McKinchin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening today's discussion on advanced nuclear technology in our efforts to decarbonize the power sector. Um, I also want to thank our panelists for sharing your expertise and your testimony. As we all know, climate change is the single greatest threat to our planet, our health, our national security, and the well-being of all our friends and neighbors. And recent reports have indicated that we're running out of time to address our climate crisis. It is more important than ever that we transition to a 100% clean economy. That is why I introduced the 100% Clean Economy Act of 2019, which directs federal agencies to use all existing authorities to put the United States on the path toward meeting the 100% clean energy economy goal while remaining technology neutral. This transition will mean the deployment of numerous current and emerging technologies. Nuclear energy has the capacity to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and it can be a great asset toward our shared goal of decarbonizing our economy. At the same time, however, nuclear energy faces many challenges including high costs and delays, safety, and waste disposal and long-term storage. Mr. Cohen, in your testimony, you speak about some of the challenges facing the nuclear industry, including safety, waste disposal, and storage. How will this nuclear waste be stored? When I say nuclear waste, I'm talking about in the advanced setting, advanced nuclear plants, be stored on site, and how do we best mitigate the potential health and environmental concerns for all communities? I mean, ultimately, and I, I'm, some of the other panelists may correct me, I mean, it's going to be the same kind of product, so it's, we're going to have to deal with it probably in a way similar to, uh, to what we do with the existing reactors. Now, I know there are some technologies, and I don't know whether TerraPower is one of them, where the waste has perhaps different composition, maybe a, a, a faster decay rate of, of toxic material, but we're still probably looking at some kind of geologic storage over time, but I, I, I would invite my fellow panelists to, to correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, you captured that well. Um, you would expect the spent fuel storage type containers to be similar, but again, our technologies will enable that waste stream initially to um, reduce that waste stream by 80 percent. And again, I'll mention the Department of Energy is, is also looking at, um, you know, ways to use the, the remaining fizzled material in that spent fuel, um, and, and we'll see where the, that policy decision leads. Uh, but advanced nuclear does, uh, and moving forward in nuclear innovation, does offer, you know, many new ways of, of looking at that, at that fuel cycle problem. I, I would add sort of two things. One, I think a number of the advanced technology developers are looking at trying to make sure 
that as they build and design, or as they design and build their facilities, that the long-term storage, at least while it needs to be on site, is integral to the, the building rather than today where you have to build a pad on the outside and place a bunch of dry storage canisters. Um, I think the other thing is that some of the fuel types with these in-in-3 reactors may provide opportunities to be more creative in terms of how that material is either treated, um, whether it's reutilized for additional power or stored. It may be in some cases um, easier to, to store in, in different types of containers uh, given the, pr the properties of the specific fuel types. Anyone else? I guess I would just add, because nuclear waste has come up, you know, several times, um, I, I would just um, ask for your consideration that what we consider waste is really future nuclear fuel. So the waste that we have today, it's simply transitioned to a different type of fuel. And there's 95% good energy still in those fuel bundles that today we call waste. So it's important that we think about that. Your kids, your grandkids, and their kids, they're going to want to understand how to use this in the future for the designs that they're going to have. So we should be thoughtful about the fact that this is a resource that can be used again. Are we capable of using it again now, or, is, or do we need some emerging technology to use it? Some of the technology that's being discussed here will, in fact, be able to use the fuel, um, and there will be uh, more of that as this uh, technology um, gets developed. For decades, low-income communities, communities of color, and tribal and indigenous communities, well, is that right? Is my time going? Your time. Okay. Um, you said no, sir? No, or sir. Yes, sir? No, sir. Well, gentlemen, we'll continue. Okay. Your <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back <laughs> with my, with the balance of, it, of his time. Uh, and this concludes our uh, witness questioning, and I want to congratulate this panel. You have been a, a superb panel, and we thank you for your patience uh, and for your participation in this hearing. And I want to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the records uh, to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. And I ask each witness to be diligent uh, to respond promptly to any such questions and that you may receive. And uh, I see a participant uh, in the audience uh, with his hand raised. I'm not sure the purpose of that but we will not entertain any questions or any comments from the audience. And now, at this time, the subcommittee uh, is adjourned.